Okay. I have a, a message asking my consent for being recorded. Yes. Which yes. Is, it's good. Yes. Everyone should accept that to stay in the meeting. Um, yeah. Yes, exactly. At this level, we're just recording, but it won't it won't be public unless we all feel the the consent for. Yes, indeed. Okay, I think we can start. It's nine thirty. So, good morning, everyone. Um, so, Claudio Gianetti, uh, Gianni Bradi, and myself, we welcome you in this uh, colloquium on emergent transport uh, phenomena in functional quantum materials, and I hope you will enjoy the program that we managed to put together. So here you see the program for today, for this morning. And there are a few things uh, for the participants. So please use your name and surname to identify yourself. So then when the questions are asked, we know who's asking. And to do that, to, do, to ask questions, you can use the chat option inside the Zoom or a raise hand option that is you can find in the participant list. And uh, one other thing, uh, this afternoon we will have a poster session for this mini colloquium at 5 p.m. So here are the details of the how to join the meeting. So you are all welcome uh, to join us there. And yeah, last thing is uh, you have the clap option that you can use at the end of the talk uh, if you agree with that. Uh, so we know further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, the first speaker. It's an invited talk uh, that it will be delivered by Ana Palau from ICMAP in Barcelona. So Ana, if you uh, can share your screen, please. Yes. yes. So, <clears throat> thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Mariela and all the organizers to give me the opportunity to present this work here, which is uh, mainly to, uh, for uh, talking about the study of high temperature superconducting films, which uh, have been uh, modulated, the oxygen has been modulated by field, you know, electrical field. Okay, no, it's not working. Oops happens like, ah, no. Okay, this work uh, have been mainly performed by these PhD students, Alejandro Fernandez, Jordi Alcala, and Juan Carlos Gonzalez, who is now abroad for a postdoc, in the, uh, with all the colleagues of the superconducting group at ICMAP, in collaboration with the group of Jordi Suñé from the Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona, Marta Gibert from the University of Zurich, Regi uh, the group of Regina Dickman in Zurich, the group of uh, Ivan Machopile in Geneva and the group of Alejandro Chilanek in Liège. Uh, the beauty of uh, uh, strongly correlated oxides, uh, it uh, arises from the complex interactions between lattice, charge, spin and orbital, which give uh, a broad spectrum of functional properties that can be used for many different applications such as high temperature superconductivity, colossal magnetoresistance, ferroelectricity, ferromagnetism, and all these uh, properties can be found in uh, different materials and different uh, structural and electronic phase transition may occur in, in these materials. In particular, for example, in this uh, figure here, I show uh, a graph of uh, lanthanum strontium manganite, where we can see that depending on the temperature and the strontium concentration, many different phases showing different electronic and magnetic phases can uh, be uh, can be found and the transition between them can be induced due to temperature or due to concentration. Moreover, uh, many other different metallic insulating transitions can be induced in, in the material, this one or other strongly correlated oxides, with uh, external perturbations that may be used to, to fabricate different devices. For example, we can use light, pressure, strain, temperature, or in the case that we are uh, dealing with is the electric field, the external perturbation that we would use in order to try to induce uh, these uh, metal insulating transitions. The 
electric field is able to change the carrier concentration in the material and depending on the compound depend and, and uh, this uh, axis here show the charge density of different materials uh, for example in the manganites we can uh, obtain colossal magnetoresistance resistance by doping the system and in in the case of cuprates uh, uh, ybco is the one that we have studied we can change the system from an insulating phase, which is antiferromagnetic, to a phase which is superconducting, depending on the temperature or metallic. And this can be achieved by modulating the, the charge carrier density in, in the material. This uh, graph here shows the temperature versus hole concentration of uh, this uh, material, the YBCO. And uh, what we observe is what I said, this insulating uh, phase transition at low concentration of doping carriers. And then when we dope the system, uh, uh, we can go to a metallic phase. And in this system, we have this phase here, the superconducting phase that arises below TC, that in this uh, YBCO material is uh, 90K. And depending on the temperature that we choose, we can induce by modulating the carrier concentration, a transition between the metallic phase to the insulating phase, or we, if we go below TC, we induce a superconducting insulating transition, directly uh, doping the material. And these kind of transitions uh, are very well studied because uh, they are very appealing for certain kind of uh, 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 applications, for example, uh, field effect uh, transistors without uh, resistance. And uh, that's why uh, the electrostatic doping has been a topic which has been widely studied uh, in many different works and uh, for doing this, for trying to, to drift the system to, from the superconducting to the metallic phase, different approaches have been uh, used. For example, in this uh, work here performed by Len et al., uh, they uh, used a very ultra thin film of YBCO, which were covered, uh, was covered by an ionic liquid, and the uh, ionic liquid uh, gate was used to transform, to 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 induce this this uh, transformation of the material from the superconducting metallic phase to the insulating phase. Other uh, approaches. Uh, used uh, uh, ferroelectric material. For example, in this work performed here by the group of Javier Villegas, they used the uh, BFO, uh, uh, ferroelectric material, uh, covering the YBCO, uh, YBCO bridge, and they uh, induced a transition in the YBCO by using the electric filtrated in the, in the ferroelectric. And in this case, they were able also to modulate the vortex spinning in the material and uh, change uh, and produce reversible vortex pinning effects. However, uh, all these systems in general, uh, they use a very ultra thin superconducting layers or they have to use uh, very large electric fields in order to be able to, to see remarkable differences in the current densities and able to, to produce this, this drift from, from the superconducting to the insulating state. Another possibility in order to, uh, to, to drift the system from one state to the other is besides the use of a pure electro, uh, elect, uh, electronic effect is to use an electrochemical doping. Uh, in this case, if we modulate the oxygen content of the material, we are able also to induce this, we, we are able to induce these, these transitions. This is the phase diagram, the same phase diagram that you observe here with the whole concentration but in, as a function of the oxygen content in the, in the YBCO cell. This delta here gives us the amount of oxygen that we put in the system, if we, uh, the, the amount of oxygen that uh, lacks the system to zero or very close to zero, we have the system close to seven, which is uh, the uh, uh, orthorhombic metallic and superconducting phase. And uh, when we reduce the oxygen content by increasing this delta, so we go uh, close to six here in this, in this uh, oxygen, we uh, induce this transition from the orthorhombic to the tetragonal phase, which is insulating. 
So this transition also can be induced at low temperature going from the superconducting to the uh, tetragonal insulating phase or above TC going from the metallic to the, to the insulating phase. And different experiments uh, trying to see this motion of the oxygen in, in by induced by a field by an electric field have shown, for example, in this very recent work of uh, the group of Alejandro Sierra, which uh, were collaborating with us, uh, they show that they, they could see that uh, very large regions of the system could be modified, the oxygen in very large region of the system, the, the system could be modified by a field induced oxygen motion, in this case, uh, by using current, by, by producing uh, what's called the electromigration effect. All this uh, study will be explained in a couple of uh, uh, talks by uh, Stefan at 10.30 in this same session. Besides the modulation of the system below TC, which allows us to modify the system and to drift the system from the superconducting to the, to the insulating state and play with, this, with these two different states, uh, also the strongly correlated oxides are very uh, strongly studied uh, in uh, another effect, which is called the switching effect. The, the resistive switching effect is an effect that has been studied in many different materials, also in uh, these strongly correlated materials. And it's based on the change of the resistance, uh, change of the of, uh, resistance when we apply an electric field. In this case, with this uh, strongly correlated oxide, size, uh, what it's mostly used is an insulating or semiconducting transition uh, metal oxide, which is sandwiched be between two metallic electrodes. And uh, what, uh, um, by applying the voltage pulse, uh, this um, insulating um, material uh, behaves as a super uh, as a conductor uh, decreases the, the the resistance and then this uh, switch can be uh, performed in a reversible way by uh, and inducing very large changes in the resistance. All these systems starts from the insulating uh, phase and the way that they go to the metallic phase is by a mechanism which is very very localized by forming an, a filament which uh, is induced in the material and produced a conduct conductance through the, the two gates, or by uh, modifying a very thin layer below the, the contact. It's an interfacial type uh, of uh, change. So uh, in all these two systems, uh, the, 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 the switching is very localized, but the performance of these materials is um, very good for uh, memory applications, and that's why it, these uh, materials are uh, widely studied for these kind of applications, because it has been observed that these structures are highly scalable, that very large resistance uh, changes can be obtained with uh, moderate voltage pulses. Moreover, uh, <clears throat> they show large endurance, large retention time and writing speed, which are uh, parameters needed for the memories. And also, this is a very important property that they can have multi-level states. And so they can be also used for other kind of more, for dense memories or also to, for neuromorphic uh, applications. In our case, we study the same effect, the resistive switching effect, but in, in, general, in metallic perovskite oxides. We start uh, with a system which is metallic, with a doping state which is metallic, and we drift the system to the, uh, the insulating phase. By doing so, <clears throat> what we uh, produce is not just a very uh, confined effect at the interface of the, uh, of the electrode, but a uh, much uh, broader effect that uh, goes to a certain volume below the, the contact. So uh, we produce a homogeneous and robust switching performance, which uh, in case of applications may might reduce the, the cycle to cycle or device to device variability and also uh, the possibility to uh, control the, the distance where we produce this switching event uh, can give us more flexibility in the case of uh, designing transistor-like devices, which uh, in the case of just a filament or just an effect uh, at, the, at the interface, 
uh, it's very difficult to try to, to design these, these devices which can be used for uh, uh, certain applications. Uh, another, another thing that we can control with these uh, materials is the possibility to correlate the switching parameters, for example, the voltage at where, where we have the transition, with the position of the metallic insulating transition uh, of the material. For example, in this experiment here, we have, uh, we have uh, evaluated three different nickelate uh, uh, layers uh, with different uh, metallic insulating transitions localized at different temperatures. And uh, with the systems, we got, with these three systems, we have uh, evaluated the switching performance and we have been able to correlate uh, the, the lower transition voltages with the material that have the metal insulating transition closer to TC which give us uh, the possibility to tune the, the material in order to tune the, the, the performance of, of the device. And also another thing is that we start uh, for, from a metallic phase of the film, so this can be uh, more easy to be integrated in a circuit because we start with, with a material which is already metallic. The system that uh, I will mainly talk about is uh, YBCO, is cuprate and is a superconducting material. And uh, the, the YBCO system or YBCO film uh, has been uh, driven from this uh, state, which is close to delta equal to one, which is the one that is metallic at uh, above TC and superconducting below TC. This is the initial state where we start with the material and then we apply voltages in uh, this film and depending on the voltage that we apply, we achieve different uh, deoxygenation states, uh, states which are under dope with a certain de delta value, which is this value here that uh, comes for the number of oxygen that we remove from the system that drift the system from this metallic to this uh, completely insulating state with a very large difference of the, of the resistance. And we would be able to use this uh, effect in order to try to see if we can fabricate devices which are in, uh, in a structure which could be used for uh, transistor-like devices that may operate at room temperature, at any temperature above TC or also below TC. And uh, we can also evaluate the possibility to uh, tune the ones below TC, to tune the superconducting state and play with the superconducting properties, uh, modulating the oxygen uh, content in, this, in these systems. What uh, we have uh, performed in the experiments is to pattern uh, YBCO layer. This is a SEM image which has been colored in order to uh, stress, the, to, to uh, show the different contacts. We have uh, a four contact configuration to test different places of the material and also we have different gates. Uh, this is the bridge of the YBCO that we use and we put different gates at different places of the bridge. And uh, in this uh, configuration, we uh, will evaluate what happens if we produce switching by using one simple gate or two different gates. And in this case, uh, by using these multi-terminal devices, we would uh, allow to have more degrees of freedom in order to design the, the these devices, for example, we can have uh, the, we can decouple the read and write operations in these materials. We can use the drain source uh, in order to read the state, and we can write the states with a gate. We can also use different gates in in the same uh, source drain system uh, to uh, couple signals from different sources to uh, study spatial temporal effects. And also, we can have the possibility to, to move the oxygen in a vertical way or in a lateral way, which might allow us to uh, try to configure or try to improve the, the performance of the figure of merit of the, the device that we want to, to go with. And <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, it's uh, important to stress that in these uh, systems, we can just use the metallic gate as a, as a 
gate for, for inducing the, the switching uh, effect, which uh, without the need of any electrostatic or ferroelectric layer, which would simplify very much, very much the, the design of the, of the system. Here uh, I present the, an example of the switching performance of one, uh, one of these uh, devices with just one gate. We are here modulating the resistance below this gate. And what we observe is that starting from uh, a high current, which is the low resistance state, and going to the negative uh, voltage, to apply a negative voltage, we lose the oxygen in the material and we induce this uh, transition to the low resistance state, which is completely non-volatile, and it stays up to zero voltage. When we then uh, change the polarization of the voltage and we apply a positive, uh, a positive uh, voltage, what we induce is the, the, the other transition from the, from the high resistance state. We apply a positive voltage and we uh, recover the oxygen to induce this transition to the low resistance state. And uh, it should be noticed that this transition from the high resistance state to the low resistance state occurs at lower voltages here, above two volts, than the transition from the high to the low. And these transitions can be, uh, can be explored at different temperatures. In this graph here, I show the resistance instead of the current, the resistance as a function of the voltage for these loops uh, obtained at 100, 300, 200 and uh, 400K. And what we observe is that the switching is observed in all the temperatures. And uh, what we observe besides is that uh, this switching, the, the amplitude of the switching from the, the, the ratio from the high to the low resistance state, it in, is increased when we reduce the temperature. And this is according to the temperature dependence of the resistance on the insulating and the superconducting phase uh, metallic superconducting that uh, here we have an increase of the resistance and here we have a decrease of the resistance giving us higher ratios at low temperatures. Uh, we have also evaluated which is the dependence of the switching performance by changing the gate electrode area. In these experiments, this loop, the, the, the Black one corresponds to a device with a very small contact, and uh, this one corresponds to a device with a high contact. And here I show the resistance as a function of the area of the contact, where we clearly see that the difference between the high and the low resistance state is reduced when we reduce the uh, contact size, which is consistent with the switching, which is homogeneously distributed be, be, below the contact. And also, we observe that very high ratios of 10 to the 6 are obtained with micrometric contacts, which would be also higher if we go to nanometric contacts. So this would be very good for, for the applications. Also, we have tested the retention of the, of the states. We have performed different um, minor loops uh, going to different voltages, uh, 2 volts, uh, 6 volts, and minus 2, minus uh, 6. And we obtain different levels of the resistance, and we have tested this uh, stability of the resistance as a function of the time. We observe a good retention uh, of, the, of, the, of the different systems, different states, sorry. And uh, this kind of uh, different levels could be, uh, could be used, for example, in order to emulate uh, the, um, the, the conductivity in a biological synapse to change the, the, the strength of these, these synapses. So uh, this uh, is a good uh, performance of the system for applying, uh, for example, in these uh, neuromorphic applications uh, above TC. Uh, also, it can be used at different temperatures. For example, here we have evaluated uh, which is the, the, the diffusion of the oxygen uh, below the gate. Uh, considering different voltage applied voltage pulses, we observe that this uh, thickness is increased by increasing the voltage pulse. And also, we have observed that this distance of the oxygen diffusion depends on the temperature. 
uh, if we perform the same experiment with uh, exactly the same voltage pulses, positive and negative, uh, at 400, 300, 200, and 100 K, we observe that this difference between the resistance is higher at higher temperature, because in this case, we have higher mobility of the oxygen, uh, uh, and at this temperature, it's much lower because the mobility is lower. And here we can see the, the evolution of this trend, uh, thickness uh, as a function of the temperature. What happens if we go below TC? Can, could we also use uh, these systems to do the direct transition from the superconducting to the to the an insulinic phase? The the answer is yes. And here we have the experiments. Uh, the the red lines, uh, the red points are uh, the points uh, obtained at 100 K, and uh, these blue points are the ones obtained at uh, lower tem uh, lower. Uh, temperatures below TC, we observe that we can uh, drift the system from this low resistance state, which is the superconducting state, to this state, which is the insulating state. And uh, this contact resistance that we measure here in this experiment is because we are me measuring in a two-point uh, configuration, because we are measuring the, the, the resistance through the rate. But if we perform the same experiment in a four-point contact configuration by measuring the resistance uh, through uh, between a source drain channel, what we obtain is that this is the TC of the starting material. And if we start from the superconducting phase, we can induce by applying a voltage force uh, transition to a non-superconducting state and then coming back to the superconducting state in a reversible way. This is the final uh, system that we obtain after the pulses. So we are able to modulate this superconducting channel and drift the channel from the uh, open and close the channel uh, by applying this uh, voltage process. We have also performed lateral uh, oxygen, oxygen motion in, motion in order, in order to, to be able to uh, see if we can move the oxygen not just below the gate but uh, from one gate to the other. And these uh, are the hysteresis loops that we obtain, which uh, show a complementary switch between uh, one gate and the other. We observe that one gate uh, switch to the low resistance state, while the other to the high, and in the contrary to the when we perform the other polarity. And by doing this kind of uh, switching, complementary switching in the two gates, we are able to induce a gradient of the oxygen between one gate and the other gate. These kind of experiments can be very useful in order to evaluate, for example, in a continuous way, different, uh, different properties of the material in a different doping states. For example, because here we have a free material without any electrode on top, which have this gradient of oxygen. In this case, for example, what we have performed is the pulse between this and this contact, inducing a gradient of oxygen between one contact and the other. And we have measured with micro Raman the delta values of the, the YBCO at the different positions between one contact and the other. And by measuring the, uh, the vibration of the oxygen four in the Raman mode, we can uh, use this experimental uh, equation to determine the delta. And we obtain that we start from a system with uh, black points uh, with the, the full points, which is optimally doped, and we produce this gradient of doping by doing this this pulse, and this is completely reversible. Uh, and I also, have uh, five minutes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We can also uh, evaluate, which is the, the the TC at different places of the bridge. For example, here we can go from the this state, which is uh, the non-superconducting state, to the superconducting state, recovering completely the TC by applying voltage pulses in the system in this lateral way. And we can evaluate which is the velocity of the oxygen going from one gate to the other by uh, considering the distance between the two gates and the voltage pulse that we have applied, which is not very fast, but it gives us a lower, uh, a lower diffusion uh, of this, uh, of the, uh, a lower value of the diffusion of this uh, uh, oxygen atoms. And we obtain that we have a diffusion which is very, very fast 
10 to the 10 times faster what it's uh, usually reported for a thermally activated diffusion of oxygen along the AV planes, which can give us the opportunity to design uh, systems which uh, have uh, high speed uh, due to these uh, extremely large gradients of the electric field that are generated in the material. We have also used uh, um, simulatical theory, uh, theoretical simulation in order to see which is the oxygen distribution between one or two gates. For example, in this uh, experiment here, we uh, polarize one gate from the low to the high resistance state and the other in the, in the other way. And here we obtain the loops. We obtain asymmetrical loops as we uh, observe experimentally. And also we can uh, modulate which is the uh, complementary behavior of the, this is the experimental uh, hysteresis loop that we obtain, and this is the theoretical one, when we clearly see that we are able to modulate, which is the oxygen distribution between those two gates, which give us a possibility to try to design the kind of uh, device that we want, depending on the, on the position on the gates. For example, in here, we have tested this distribution of oxygen in a, in a drain source channel with multiple gates. And by changing the, uh, by inducing a polarization between these two gates, we observe that close to the gates, uh, we have uh, uh, here, for example, a deoxygenation of the system, and here an oxygenation of the system because the oxygen reorder inside of the of the bridge. And so, in these parts of the bridge, we have one one uh, behavior and the complementary in the other part, and uh, the 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 sum of the two the the, the all the effects is zero because we have conservation of oxygen be uh, between the the draft. And uh, finally, uh, I will show uh, the experiments that we have started to perform in order to see if these, um, these bridges can be used in order to change the pinning properties of, of this, these, uh, these uh, systems. Uh, we have uh, measured the resistance, the TC, and also the JC of one bridge um, before uh, at, the, at the starting point. And uh, after reducing, uh, uh, switching to the low resistance state here in red, we reduce the TC and also we infer in the, in the pinning performance of the material. This is the critical current density as a function of the magnetic field. And we observe that the critical current density can be reduced. And also by applying a pulse of the other polarity, we can uh, change the, uh, and come back to the initial state again. So um, being able to introduce reconfigura reconfigurable pinning potentials and change the, the pinning of the system just by applying this, this uh, uh, electric field. With this, I will uh, end with the conclusions of, of this work. Uh, I have shown that we have been able to, uh, to modulate the normal state resistance and also manipulate the, the, the superconducting phase uh, um, uh, in, by inducing these uh, voltage pulses. We have uh, been able to modulate the resistance by uh, these uh, moderate voltage uh, pulses by, uh, and, and using very high resistance ratios. We have also been able to derogate a bridge, which is superconductor and use a, a superconducting insulating transition in a, in a configuration which is a transistor like that configuration with, with a gate that controls the, if the system is superconducting or, or, or insulating. And uh, we uh, have seen that this uh, kind of experiments support the, the possibility to study these uh, materials in, in a system where we have a very controlled uh, gradient of the oxygen to be, to be used to study this complex phase diagram of, of the, this material. Thank you for your attention. And that's... Uh, thanks, Anna. Um, so, uh, for the ones that uh, join later, you can ask uh, questions in, using the chat or raising your hands. Uh, I don't see any raised hands if someone sees, or just write in the chat that you want to ask a question and we will open your microphone. Um, so, in the meantime, maybe I can ask for a, a question. I don't know if you, I, if I miss it, but uh, did you mention in which substrates do you grow this uh, 
materials. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I didn't mention it. Uh, usually we use uh, LAO, but uh, STO or LAO and the, for the YBCO are the ones yeah, that we Yeah, I was just thinking for, I mean, for all the interesting applications that you were mentioning, if, uh, I mean, how critical is also that, you know, that you have um, crystalline yeah, films and so on, yeah. But yeah, if you check they, also this phenomena in maybe other films that are not so uh, crystalline. Yeah, no, we, 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 one, one thing that we want to try is to see if we see any effects in, in films which are not epitaxial, but we don't think that this would be, uh, would give uh, us very good results. We, we will have to try because this would be the easiest part, but then we will not have this superconducting state and for, for room temperature, they could work, but at low temperatures, not. And then the other, the other possibility is to try to use all the, all the systems that now are studied a lot to try to transfer these films in, in systems that can be CMOS compatible or these kind of things that uh, uh, they are trying to, to use by, by doing some transferring of the film or growing with buffer layers or these kind of approaches that can go um, close to the, the place what we need for the applications. But this is some problem that we, everybody have with, uh, with epitaxial, epitaxial films. Yeah. Okay, so there is a question from uh, Celico. Uh, I would, yeah, you can ask the question yourself if you prefer. Uh, so I have a small question about this hysteresis that I see on, on some of these RV curves, right? Uh, yes. my, my question would be is uh, how, I mean, I assume this is just the consequence of the design of the system, right? So I would ask how precisely could we actually tune this hysteresis that exists? That's this asymmetry between positive and negative voltages. Yeah, yeah. The asymmetry, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that it can be tuned um, quite well with the position of the with with the position and the size of the of the contact that you use because uh, with the simulations we have been able to I don't know if I can move now the presentation yeah with the simulations we have seen that this uh, this um, yeah. Here, this asymmetry can be very well um, reproduced in the simulations. Here, for example, we have the transition at two, and here we have the transition at one. And this is due to uh, the fact that in the high resistance state, we have a very large electric field, and so this transition goes much faster than the transition from the low to the high. So by changing, the, for example, the size of the contacts from one side to the other, or by changing the redis, by, by trying to modulate what happens with different configurations of the contacts, we um, should be able to, to put these two very close or uh, as close as possible to be what you would need for the applications, for Sorry. kind of applications. For example, yeah, so, so. neuromorphic applications, you would need these to be quite uh, uh, symmetric. But th these curves that you that you show right now here on your screen share, are those curves obtained, uh, let's say, in a transition from superconducting to the normal state? And they, are they only obtained from solving this heat balance equation? No, no, these are exper uh, non-experimental. Non these are theoretical. Yeah, theoretical, but that, that's why I'm saying, like, did you only uh, simulate? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, we just did the, the theoretical calculations at room temperature by using the... the ah, the, okay, okay, so at room temperature, yeah. 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 So it would all, I, I guess probably, I mean, uh, if you would have a model that, that can simulate also, the, let's say, the state of superconductors, such as the Landau theory or something like that, that's coupled with this, probably this would then probably be an, even more closer to the experiment. Yeah, yeah, and also with the superconducting state, we have the, the thing that uh, it, at, set, at some point we reach the, the JC and we have features that uh, we should be able also to model. So okay. yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to try to do this at low temperature, at, 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 at the superconducting state, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, anyone else a question? We have one minute. I, I, I have a quick question, yes. Mariela. Yes, uh, sure. is, there, is there any role of the charge order uh, when you switch from the superconducting state? What do you mean? 
if the fact that the, the system can develop a, a charge ordain that is competing with superconductivity can be used as an additional way uh, of manipulating the transition from the superconducting state to the normal one. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that yeah, we have all the all the effects in in the same in the same experiment, and so that's I we think that it's it's quite interesting to, for example, use different uh, experimental tools to to not not just uh, evaluate the oxygen content, but also to evaluate the real uh, charge uh, charge current density and charge ordering in, for example, a gradient induced by this kind of experiments to try to see which is the kind of uh, transitions that we are induced. If it's, it's just something that uh, drift the oxygen or move all, all the, change also the distribution of the, of, the, of the carriers, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Javier Del Valle has a question as well. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a small question. So at the beginning of the talk, you show some data related uh, to neodymium nickelate. Have you done this type of experiments also in the nickelate system? This guy, the, which ones? Uh, I, I couldn't see very well what uh, you were showing, but was it resistive switching experiments in the nickelate? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we did uh, just uh, in the in the nickelate, we changed the the uh, the doping of the nickelate and also we change the substrates in order to to have different transition uh, metallic insulated transitions and what we did is to uh, evaluate the switching in the different systems but not not in a really um, not not in this in this degree of uh, detail we didn't we didn't do the simulations or anything but we just evaluating different cycles taken at room temperature for the different systems we could uh, tune and we could uh, correlate the position of the of the transition with the switching performances in in hysteresis loops yeah, with the okay. form of hysteresis loops. thank you okay thanks um i don't know if anyone else the very last one if not no okay thanks a lot anna it was a very thank nice you. talk and um, now we can move to the next one, uh, Ricardo Arpaia, if you can share. Yeah, I will uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead, okay. uh, Ricardo. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, let me thanks the organizer One moment. for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, in, this, uh, in this talk, I will show you first uh, the charge order is a phenomenon uh, dominating the phase diagram of the cuprates. And later on in the, in the core of the seminar, we'll present a recent experiment where by combining the transport and spectroscopical measurements and using strain as a new uh, degree of freedom to modify the ground state, we have discovered that charge order strongly affects the, the, the transport in a critical temperature superconductors. Uh, the experiment I will present, as you can see here, is the result of cooperation of several institutions and universities. And in particular, the work has been possible the strong connection between the group of Florian Lombardi at Chalma and the group of Giacomo Gringelli at Politecnico di Milano. So, uh, let's start with the material, uh, the phase diagram of the ITC Cooper superconductors, as you also saw in the previous talk, is, is very complicated. Uh, it's characterized by various order states that are formed by the doping, and now the identification of all these states is a crucial step toward the understanding of two of the grand challenges in solid state physics, uh, the high temperature superconductivity and the strange metal phase, uh, which is uh, characterized by uh, the linear dependence of the resistivity on the temperature. The strange uh, metal phase, which is uh, uh, dominating at uh, optimally uh, doped regime, is a manifestation of a strong correlation, and one would expect to extend 
uh, also to the underdoped part of the phase diagram, where electron electron interaction in principle should be stronger than at optimal doping due to the uh, reduced screening, which follow from a smaller carrier density at this level of doping. However, for underdoped hoop rates, uh, we know that the strange metal is lost uh, below the pseudo gap uh, temperature, uh, T star. Where, and below this temperature, we know that uh, uh, different intertwined orders on which there is also charge density wave characterize the, the, the ground state of, of this material. So now what happened is in, this, uh, in this region, in the charge density wave uh, region? Then, well, uh, the, uh, this region, which was uh, experimental evidence, it was only produced recently, uh, thanks to the mostly to the development of the resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. Um, is characterized by valence electrons that are lying in the copper dioxide planes, which tend to segregate into periodical uh, modulations, which are incommensurate with respect to the unit cell. Uh, the, the interest uh, is, is given by the visible competition that there is between the disorder and the superconductivity, which is highlighted uh, by the fact that charge density wave is maximum in correspond at the one over eight uh, uh, looping level, uh, which correspond to this depression of the superconducting uh, of the dome. Um, however, the, the ability of charge density wave to influence uh, the properties of the hoop rates, both in the superconducting and in the normal state, has always been questioned. And this is mostly because charge density wave, as you can see here, only occupy a very tiny, small region of the phase diagram, all in the underdoped uh, part, and only below the pseudo gap temperature. Because there is a reason to clarify a bit more the physics at play, one has to follow two interconnected uh, paths. So on one side, uh, the advanced in experimental uh, technique uh, led to extract now from the measurement more and more information, and RICS is one of the biggest players. And um, on the other side, now new system uh, have to be used. Uh, in, in particular, when using thin films and normal pattern of the structure, the strain can be used as an additional degree of freedom to modify the ground state. And this can let to emphasize the possible competition or intertwining between the different, uh, the different orders. And in the next uh, part of the talk, I will just present how we can combine now these two ingredients, these two different uh, paths together. So, uh, for those who are not familiar, let's start now with discussing a bit more in details about the resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, in particular the copper ultra edge where measurement in, on YBCO are, are, are performed. Um, uh, RIX is uh, resonant uh, because the energy of the incidence photon is chosen uh, so to uh, coincide with and so to resonate with one of the atomic X-ray absorption edge of the system. The RIX event can be taught as a two-step process. Uh, the incoming X-ray, um, in fact, uh, excite an electron from, from a core level uh, into an empty valence band. And then the empty uh, core state is, uh, is filled by an electron from the uh, occupied state under the emission of an X-ray. You know, depending on the difference between the energy loss between the incoming and the emitted photon, we can study different uh, uh, excitation. In particular, uh, if the scattering process uh, is elastic, we can uh, have access to um, uh, excitation that are due to charge, so to the charge order. Vice versa, on, in, from the inelastic part of the spectrum, we can have access to several excitation of the lattice, the phonons of the uh, of ma magnetic, the bang, non uh, orbitals, so the, the excitation and charge transfer. In RICS, we can not only control the energy uh, of, the, of the photons, but also the momentum of the generated excitation. And this is done by moving the sample uh, or detector with respect to the incoming uh, photon. And uh, finally, this is typical RIC spec of, uh, we, of uh, WebCO at the copper L3 edge that show all of the uh, excitation that I previously mentioned. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, just uh, a few minutes ago, the, the first observation of incommensurate charge density wave was in WebCO and was done by using the RICs. And here we see different spectra, a different uh, um, moment along the H direction, the reciprocal lattice unit. And as you can see here, the intensity of the quasi-elastic region here, close to the zero energy loss, uh, change as a function of momentum with a maximum which is reached at, um, uh, at the, the Q vector of man, uh, 0 0.30. Uh, the, the intensity of this quasi-elastic region is integrated and then here is plotted as a function of the temperature. 
the competition with supercomputing is highlighted by the fact that the intensity of this charge order peak uh, is increasing when approaching TC, but then below the TC starting suppressed. Uh, so what happened in the last uh, five years? Uh, the development was, uh, was quite significant, and in particular, uh, a system, a new system has been designed for uh, the ID32 beamline at SRF, ERIX, uh, thanks to um, a junction work of SRF and Politecnico di Milan. And here the sensitivity of the instrument to very small phase signal is strongly improved. Uh, the energy resolution has been reduced down to 30 milli electron volt, with the aim to go even below 25 milli electron volt. And improving so much the solving of power gives the possibility now to distinguish and separate uh, features that before were not even visible, as you can see here in this, uh, in this plot. So uh, what we have done is just to repeat the beginning experiment from 2010 on, uh, again, on the same sample on YBCO, uh, in a very uh, wide uh, um, range of the doping and in temperature. And uh, by using this new system, and what we've seen is that basically we have a strong charge density wave peak at low temperature that it becomes smaller and smaller when they're increasing the temperature, but still we see a clear broad peak, which is an indication of a quite short range charge density uh, signal, even at very high temperature, even above the subject temperature. And this is this been seen both at the underdoped level and in the optimally doped uh, level. So the situation is very much different from what was commonly uh, believed till, uh, till a couple of years ago, because this was basically the phase diagram that I showed you before, in which charge density wave was just occupying a very small region of the phase diagram. But in reality, charge density wave is uh, dominating the phase diagram of, of cuprates, since this uh, uh, charge density fluctuation, because they are short range, that are also dynamical, uh, because they are associated with um, finite energy, really occupy uh, the, the wall uh, superconducting part of the phase diagram. And so with, uh, what we can see is that before the charge density wave, we're just uh, representing the tip of the iceberg of the total uh, charge order phenomenon. And now we should expect that charge density, uh, charge order being supervasive has to influence the properties of this material. Uh, and first, there was already a theoretical proposal that associate, uh, the clearly associated the uh, strange metal behavior to the presence of this charge density fluctuation occupying the uh, high temperature strange metal phase of the phase diagram. I will not go into discussion about it because yesterday it was already discussed uh, in, the, in the beautiful talk by Carlo Di Castro during this, uh, this conference. Uh, so now I will go uh, presenting some, something more that we have done in order to understand how charge order influence this, the properties of this, of this material in the normal state. And now to investigate deeper into charge order, uh, what we do is we want to study the material in, in thin film form. Uh, thin films are in fact crucial because the strain induced by substrate can be used as additional degree of freedom. And uh, uh, in this way, we basically we play with the unit cell uh, since, uh, uh, since we can uh, in this way uh, achieve something which is a sort of a new material. Uh, and in the case of WebCO, uh, this is the unit cell, as you also saw in the, in the, in the previous talk. Uh, the cell is orthorhombic since copper oxide chains are unidirectional, going around the, uh, the axis direction. And uh, basically, doping the material means adding oxygen atom into the chains that then dope uh, with holes the copper dioxide uh, planes, giving rise to all the phenomenology that we can observe in the phase diagram. So, to study WebCO uh, in films, uh, First of all, underdoped films of bipolarity are needed. But of course, that's not enough, uh, because what we uh, need to, to have is a proper thin film platform. Indeed, we also need to grow films high quality uh, as a function of the thickness down to puny cells so that the strain, the strain effect in this by subset can be enhanced. And finally, the films have to be also untwinned uh, since we want uh, to avoid uh, a, a random uh, rotation of the unit cell, so to preserve basically the unidirectionality of the copper uh, uh, oxide chains uh, throughout the whole, uh, the whole sample. And basically this platform is what we have uh, developed at Chalmers uh, during the last decade. So we start with the underdog films that have grown uh, both on MGO and on SEO substrate, and how we did it was just by um, changing the in situ uh, oxygen uh, post annealing pressure in the chamber, so after the deposition. And as you see here, we measure the average to steel different films, but just as a function of the post annealing pressure. 
And basically, we achieve the critical temperature going from the insulating to the mm, strongly undertopped up to the uh, slightly overdoped uh, films. And of course, the R versus T curves are mm, very much different among each other. Uh, there is a linear dependence uh, at very high temperature, and then a quadratic dependence of the resistance of a temperature at lower temperature. And from this temperature, from this uh, behavior, we can extract different temperatures, the pseudo gap temperature and, and other temperature. And then we plot this temperature as a function of the, of the doping of the film. And amazingly enough, what we see is the phase diagram, which is in perfect agreement with those of a, a single crystal. And in particular, I want to highlight here that we see also the depression of the superconducting phase diagram, which is so a strong hint of the presence of charge density wave in the system that we are doing, even in few units of thick films. Then we have done ultra thin films, and also in this case, our films show very good quality down to uh, five nanometers. What does it mean? This means that the onset of the superconducting transition is unchanged because this is set by the oxygen doping level of the film. And so it's always the same as a function of thickness. Uh, vice versa, the superconducting transition becomes broader and broader when decreasing the thickness because the film approach a 2D material. So the transition is ruled by the uh, Berezinski costly stowless transition and the zero resistance critical temperature becomes smaller and smaller. And what we observe is that down to five nanometer, basically our critical temperature, the zero resistance critical temperature is in perfect agreement with the best result that people have achieved in the long time, long time ago when sandwiching YBCO between two layers of PVCO. Why in our case, instead, uh, YBCO is not sandwiched by this, uh, by this seed and cutting layer. And these properties also hold for underdoped films. And then finally, a challenge we also uh, developed on twinned uh, YBCO films on different substrate, on MGO and on SEO substrate, so to induce also uh, opposite strain, because on uh, STO we can get a tensile strain, uh, induced by the by the subset on the YBCO, and this uh, is commonly done since uh, several decades by using basically this angle cut substrate. Uh, what we have developed inside the challenge is the new uh, technique uh, on uh, MGO by uh, basically doing annealing of the substrate, which induces a reconstruction of the uh, substrate surface, as you can see here, the MGO just before and after this annealing process. And then we started with using X-ray, basically the twinning state. Here, basically, we see in the plane uh, the, the presence uh, along one direction in, 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 the, in, in the plane of both A and B axis. And it is given, basically, the presence of two peaks, the 308 and the 038 uh, peak. And what happened is that, basically, in one direction, we only, see all, we only see one peak, because only one axis is present in any direction, because the thing is untwinned. And we got uh, untwinning the percentage between 80 and 90 degrees and beyond, which are the best achieved so far in WebCO team films. And then finally- Ricardo, we, sorry, you have uh, two minutes. Okay, fine. And then we pattern uh, this film by using a technique that we have improved by using a, a carbon hard mask in combination with the lithography and argon ion milling. And basically, by doing so, we can get a structure that are unaffected by the pattern in preserving and pristine what properties. And we pattern now this microbar as a function of the in-plane axis of the substrate. And what we have seen is that now on peak film grown on MGO, if we study the resistivity versus temperature, we get something which is conventional. So the linear behavior uh, at high temperature of the resistivity, it's, uh, it's the same on both the A and the axis direction. And the in anisotropy that we have, uh, is uh, about 1.2 between the two axes, which is expected considering the formicity of the cell and the presence of the copper oxide chains. Uh, if we go instead to very thin films, only 10 nanometers thick, the situation dramatically changed because the anisotropy between A and B changed dramatically. And also, what is more surprising, the linearity changed a lot since along the B axis, basically, we have an average T which resembles the one of an optimally doped uh, regime, even though these films here are under doped. Uh, we have uh, done this investigation as a function of the doping, and we've seen basically that this effect of the, this anisotropy of this uh, TL, the, the linearity temperature where the linearity in the, of the average of finish, uh, basically is present in the same range in which charge density wave is present. So we just ask ourselves, can this be connected with charge density wave? And this is indeed what we have seen. Uh, in fact, in the 50 nanometer film, what we get is that at high temperature, we only have charge density fluctuation, this very broad peak, and then at low temperature, we get uh, uh, in both direction, a peak of charge density wave. But when we go to the 10 nanometer instead, along the axis, we have a presence of charge density wave very similar to the one of the peak film. 
but along the day axis instead, the charge density wave is totally suppressed. So what we have is basically that in ultra thin films grown on MGO, the disappearance of the charge density wave along the day axis is associated with an extension of the linear in-t behavior of the resistance along the b-axis. And this is due to strain, because what we have seen with X-ray is that basically the uh, b-axis increased while the axis remained the same. So the thrombicity increased. And the uh, increase of thrombicity is connected to a modification that is being predicted theoretically of the Fermi surface that make basically the Fermi axis to, uh, uh, to, to, to be closed along the B-axis uh, direction. So basically what we have, uh, the picture that we, we, we have uh, um, support with this experiment is that in principle, we have that the strange metal uh, behavior that was expected in a very broad range of the of doping, even under doped, is somehow uh, blocked by the presence of the charge density wave. But as soon as we are able to remove charge density wave, what happened is that we recover the original picture in which basically this strange metal can also extend down to the underdoped where the uh, stronger uh, correlation are, are present. So uh, with this, I just come to, to the conclusion. Basically with this experiment, we are just adding uh, new pieces of the puzzle in the story of ITC quick rates. And basically with, uh, with the development of RICS, what we've seen is that charge order is not just an epiphenomenon present in a very small part of this diagram, but it's really a big uh, fundamental phenomenon that is uh, present everywhere in the this diagram. And then now by combining RICS with transport and using uh, um, the strain as an additional uh, degree of freedom, we have seen that the charge density wave strongly dominated the transport in the, in the underdoped basically, uh, modifying uh, the strange metal behavior that would let the uh, resistance to be linear, basically, in the whole temperature dependence down to, to, to C. And with this, I just thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, well, again, uh, if anyone can ask questions, wants to ask questions. Ah, yes. I forgot. <laughs> I have uh, one, one quick, yes. quick question. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, not Ricardo. Um, so, what, what do you think about the relation between the the charge order fluctuations and the real charge density wave? So, uh, are they independent phenomena? Because from no. the data, it looks. So, I mean, the charge density wave is just an evolution of the charge. Uh, Basically, yeah. what we can think about is that basically charge density fluctuations are a sort of precursor charge density wave. So at high temperature, we have this, uh, with this C of very small wave with very short uh, correlation. And then when decreasing the temperature, at some point, some of these uh, very small islands start coagulating, uh, giving rise to a charge order that is more longer range, which is the one described by the charge density wave. So okay, the, but the, the, the periodicity, the, is the periodicity exactly the same? The periodicity, yes, is very similar because the co-vector that is associated to charge density fluctuation and charge density wave are, is basically the same. It's very, very similar. Uh, the difference, uh, apart the, um, the coherence length, the correlation length, is given by the, the energy associated to this phenomenon because uh, the charge density fluctuations are dynamical. They are really associated to a finite energy in the order of several uh, milliliter volt. While instead, basically, we're going down in temperature and going to the charge density wave, we are studying a phenomenon which is quasi static. That will become static in, in absence of superconductivity because this is basically a critical phenomenon. So basically, when approaching the zero temperature, you would expect this phenomenon to become completely static. But of course, superconductivity uh, it, it goes against this evolution. And to check basically this evolution, what people have done is just applying binary field. And then applying binary field, what you see is that charge density wave become three dimensional and really become a static phenomenon, which is really, uh, yeah, 3D, because it also not, it is not only related only to the charge, uh, to the copper dioxide planes, but is also connected to the, to, to, to the, uh, the cross talking between the different copper oxide planes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I was uh, just wondering in your in the extreme thin fields, right? Five nanometers. One. Yes. Think, I mean, I'm I'm not sure, but it's in in uh, YBCO is like I thought that 
the, well, the, for example, the oxygen concentration of the doping, of course, can be very critical, you know, so do you need to, because you, let's say you don't cap it compared to other people that they do cap or sandwich. Yes, uh, so in still, in still in the high nanometers, you believe that you have a very stable and homogeneous, let's say, doping. Yes, yeah, this is just what we have measured basically with resistance versus temperature measurement because so it's very stable. Then, yeah. then, if we want to go below five nanometers, we need to use a, only a capping layer of gold, even quite thin, in order yeah. to, to preserve the um, correct oxygen concentration. But yeah, also five nanometers is how many unit cells, right? So it's very it's four unit cells, yeah. yeah, okay, so we are very at the limit. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, below that limit, basically, we see that the superconductive properties start degrading because there is a very strong oxygen out diffusion. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. I think uh, so. We can stop here, okay. uh, so we can still be more some time. And uh, we ask Stefan uh, Marinkovic. Hello. Uh, hi. Good can morning, everyone. Thank you yeah. for listening in. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Sorry, I just want to say, uh, Janif, I don't know if you saw my message. Uh, just if you can contact Matthias, just to be sure that everything is fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Stefan, thanks. Okay, um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and our hosts for organizing this conference and for taking us all online. I'm Stefan and uh, I will be presenting a wor our work that I did in the experimental physics of nanostructured materials lab under the uh, supervision of Professor Silhanek. Uh, of course, together with our, uh, uh, our collaborators from Spain and Belgium and the US, most of all, uh, Anna Palau, who, was, who had the first talk this morning, who also mentioned us. Uh, the reference for the paper you can see uh, here. We basically studied uh, electromigration in YBCO as another method of tuning the oxygen content and by this, this oxygen content, the properties of the materials. We have uh, focused a lot on visualization, on looking at the material and how we can actually see the diffusion of oxygen through our materials. So. In essence, uh, I don't think I, uh, I have the luxury of not having to talk that much about why we picked YBCO, one of the most well-known uh, high temperature superconductors because it has been talked about quite a lot this morning. I would like to highlight the structures of uh, tetragonal and orthorhombic uh, YBCO where the orthorhombic material is the superconducting one at high oxygen content. And in this orthorhombic structure, uh, I would furthermore like to highlight the, uh, the chains of copper and oxygen that exist in this uh, AB plane from copper one and oxygen one as they are marked here. They are important because they are the most probable reason for the uh, much, la much significantly larger oxygen diffusivity, specifically of this oxygen in these chains throughout the material that allows us to use electromigration later to actually tune the, met uh, the metal because electromigration is selective in such materials where one atom has a much higher, higher diffusivity than the others. So um, it is uh, important to uh, understand that the oxygen content controls the whole doping and by that all the properties of the material and then the, that YBCO has a very complicated phase diagram. But I think after both, uh, both Anna Stock and uh, Ricardo's, we are quite all aware of that and I included just this phase diagram to illustrate. We are uh, motivated to do this because it has been of interest to modulate the properties of YBCO as discussed earlier. And it is well studied using electrical fields to do this as in Anna's uh, work that she, she has presented or using ferroelectric films or even uh, ionic liquids as in the works of uh, Begon Lourdes in, in the image under B and uh, Dout in image C. But we wanted to change this uh, up a little and look at modulating by electrical current uh, instead. And this is, of course, possible due to the effects of electromigration, which is here uh, illustrated on this scheme, where an electron is illustrated as a hitting an atom and presenting and in, uh, ex exerting this force to move to cause diffusion. Now, because in YBCO we have significantly larger diffusion of the oxygen one we can expect that uh, the electromigration in this material be, will be selective to this oxygen and by that will modulate all the other properties of the material. 
In order to do this, we have, uh, uh, we have used two different samples, both of uh, 100 nanometer, nanometer uh, thick C-aligned YBCO films on lanthanum aluminate, and all of them behaved as uh, very, good, very good superconductors. Uh, we got them from, from Anna's, Anna's group. So as you can see here with clear, uh, clear transitions below this thinner than one Kelvin at about 90 Kelvin. Uh, we have used several imaging techniques, including optical, magneto-optical, and scanning electron microscopies, and also micro-Raman microscopies, and several electrical configurations to characterize this. Uh, the, our, our structures. Notably, we have performed electro migrations, we have performed uh, temperature and versus resistance measurements, and we have did, uh, done uh, Hall effect measurements on the second more complicated structure that I will be talking about in a minute. So first of all, we use this bow tie like structure here to uh, inspect uh, what happens with our thin film uh, if we if inspect it visually or optically during electro migration. The outline here on this image shows the bow tie length structure and the uh, electron migration process starts at A and proceeds through to E. As you can see, there is a, uh, these are differential images. That means uh, we, we uh, subtract sequential images one from e, e, the next. And as you can see, there is a propagating front of uh, change in the reflectivity of the material that we can see as electron migration progresses. And it's strongly directional towards the left the uh, cathode is on the left side and the anode on the right side. And you see that the, the, the pro front propagates clearly to one side. The, the pictures here correspond on this resistance versus uh, current curve to the points indicated here. This curve is uh, taken during the electron migration, which takes a course over several hours. Now, this, uh, this process causes loss of super, eventual loss of superconductivity in this bridge, but we did not have enough information just from this simple structure. So we redesigned our uh, junctions to have access to both the cathode and the anode side after and before electron migration. So in this uh, spider-like structure, let's say, uh, we uh, performed uh, resistance versus temperature measurements before and after electron migration uh, that are shown uh, on the image below. As you can see, these, are, these, uh, image, uh, these line curves are all uh, normalized so that you can see that before electron migration, our whole device behaves as a monolithic structure. But after we perform electron migration, this changes significantly. The right side, the anode side here indicated in blue, does not change from the pristine state, while the central and left sides, that is this and this, uh, change with the central bridge uh, losing superconductivity uh, completely and the left uh, having a smeared out transition. Notably, both of them re uh, keep their, their uh, have increased normal state resistance, but keep a small, at least a small transition at 90 Kelvin showing uh, a probable inhomogeneous uh, transition in the material. This image here was taken after a significant electron migration. So this one was somewhat gentle, but you can see that there is a clear difference in optical uh, reflectivity of the, of the electromigrated side of the material and the not electromigrated side of the material. So there is a number of properties that change in the, in the material and we have uh, clear evidence that there is a movement of oxygen that is of vacancies towards the cathode and oxygen atoms towards the anode. Going further, we have uh, compared the change in uh, critical temperature and by uh, and carrier density by proxy of hole measurements after several electro migrations. So in these these images here, you can see uh, uh, we have performed four electro migration runs on one device and have measured uh, first the critical temperature. In the green is the central bridge, red is the cathode side, and blue is the anode side. And we have compared at these two points the carrier densities gained by, by uh, carrier concentrations. And as you can see, the carrier concentration drops on the cathode side and slightly increases on the anode side, while the, uh, the critical temperature drops most rapidly in the central part and a little slower in the in the cathode side. We compared this to some uh, other experimental results by Liang et al. and have shown good overlap uh, with, within, well, there are some uh, considerations to be taken, like they uh, measured in, in single uh, crystals at room temperature, while this was measured at uh, lower temperature in our 
devices, but still there is a significant overlap which shows that this could be useful to tune our to tune devices. We have uh, similarly, like uh, Anna mentioned, we have used the O4 uh, phonon mode, uh, which is Raman active both in the orthorhombic and the tetragonal material to compare the, uh, to get an in, uh, idea of the oxygen content of our materials. And uh, we have measured after two of the electron migrations I mentioned in the last slide on these points, the uh, Raman shift of the O4 phonon mode and compared it to the oxygen content. And we see a clear, uh, move, drop of oxygen content first in the central bridge and then spreading out towards the cathode side while the oxygen content increases slightly on the anode side. So, uh, giving further proof for uh, change of oxygen concentration as expected. Another expect that has, uh, effect that has been uh, studied, uh, for example, by Markovic et al, is photo excitation in underdoped YBCO films. That means that if uh, illuminated, underdoped uh, uh, YBCO becomes less resistive and shows a drop of uh, critical temperature in underdoped films. So this effect should be reserved only for the central and left part of our bridges because those are underdoped after electromigration and the right part should uh, not show these effects and that's exactly what we get. We show a drop of, of critical temperature in, in, the, in the films and uh, we, show an increase, we show a decrease of the, of the normal state resistance. Note this, uh, that uh, this increase here cannot be a heating effect because it is absent here and uh, is probably an, another effect. If uh, this, like uh, the reference I mentioned, Markovic et al. Uh, writes, it is an effect that has a very long relaxation time. So if you take a look here, uh, over time, as we illuminate the film, the resistance drops. But after turning off the film, uh, if the film is not electromigrated, there is no change through illumination. But if you illuminate an electromigrated film, there is a drop in resistance. If you turn the light off and, and warm up, the change of resistance is on a much longer time scale, on the on scale of days and weeks. We have also further investigated if it is possible to heal films by uh, switching the polarity of, of the effect. And we have, uh, for that, uh, there also performed optical, uh, optical imaging. There's also a video available uh, in the supplementary material also, which is published. Um, as you can see, there is again a propagating front on the other side. Now the polarity is switched and the cathode is on, uh, is on the right side, but, and we do not effectively see much healing. What we see is a new propagating front going to, towards the right. But in, on, if we inspect differential images again, we can see that one part of the, uh, of the junction becomes uh, darker. That is, there is at least some partial healing, but there's probably uh, some, uh, loss of oxygen through the process. We have used some uh, COMSOL, uh, uh, COMSOL uh, simulations to, to compare these results to, our, to expectations similarly to what Lana showed and we have again shown uh, how electromigration as expected starts at the, at the, narrow, at the, the narrow neck of the, of the uh, triple constrictions and moves out towards, uh, towards the, the cathode side and the, then even eventually moves towards the left. We have um, we have, as I mentioned, uh, on the resistance versus temperature curves, we have we suspect, we suspect inhomogeneous growth. So we have uh, taken a look uh, on the under the under a scanning electron microscope, as you can see in image C, and we see indications of filamentary growth throughout the material with a higher uh, with a, a higher well brightness, higher intense signal intensity coming from these filamentary growths here. But and th this image is from the inland uh, sensor, which collects uh, all the uh, SE, uh, secondary electrons, while this one collects only the lower energy uh, secondary electrons. The, this is an Evanhart, Evanhart th uh, Thornley detector, and it indicates more of a topological contrast. And we see that there is no much difference in the topology, but there is this change, this filamentary character that we see here. If you look under an optical microscope, you see a change in reflectivity as we have sh shown in some literature references that are commonly seen, commonly mentioned, but in the dark field uh, optical imaging, which is, which is also supposed to be a topological, more topological contrast, we do not see any difference, indicating that there is no topological change, but that the change is truly in the stoichiometry of the material. But with the SEM images, we probably could say that it is filamentary and inhomogeneous. 
So uh, in conclusion, uh, we have shown that local deoxygenation and change of oxygen concentration in YVCO is possible by large current densities. We have, uh, we have performed uh, progressive uh, current stimulated oxygen migration to tune this, uh, this uh, oxygen stoichiometry. And we have shown that the effects are not completely reversible if performed by current and uh, that the effects are inhomogeneous and need further study. And we have sh shown that we have agreed with the findings that the electromigration is selective to the O1 oxygen. We now would like to is isolate a single filament if we could, if we could go, go make something that small to see what, uh, how, if we could make a completely reversible device by isolating a single filament. And we wanted to compare the A and B diffusivity of the material that they, because they have been known to, uh, to be very different in these two lattice directions and our films are, do not distinguish them. Uh, we could combine the effects that we find with the findings of, for example, ANA and work on something that would connect or combine the effects of field-induced field and current-induced oxygen migration. And we could compare similar materials like, uh, like other perovskites or other cuprate superconductors or similar materials. Uh, with that, uh, I will thank you for your attention and I can, will answer questions. Thanks, uh, Stefan. Interesting images, really nice images. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are questions in the audience. Yeah. So you just mentioned at the end that you want to distinguish between A and B um, mm -hmm. direction. So in the experiments that you've done, but you, you do know which is the crystalline direction of your film or not? Yes, I know that they are C aligned, but the A and B directions are not completely distinguished. There are grain boundaries and, and well Okay, yeah. So yeah. we would need a miscut film or, a, well, essentially an untwinned film of a, a YBC where we could use different directions of the devices to to compare essentially the two the yeah. differences. And we have seen similarly, like Anna, we have seen very, very large uh, differences in compared to the expected uh, length of the fusion in our films. Okay. So what you you see here, this is essentially 30 micrometers. While from the diffusivity constants at, at the temperatures that we estimate here for, from uh, using the device as a, therm a thermometer, we would expect something much more in the range of three or four micrometers. So there is a large difference in the, yeah. the actual diffusion we observe and the diffusivity of the mater material that we know. But in, in your simulations, uh, simulations that you showed, you, there you showed these times. So these are kind of, is that real times or? Uh, well, that's the that's the simulation, the simulation time. Okay, that's yeah. simulation steps. So, yeah, the real yeah. times, so the real time of uh, these processes. I didn't show it here. I showed it in the first one, but it's again uh, somewhere in the range of hours. Oh, that doesn't let me click on my hyperlinks. Hmm. Yeah, here. So this is this was, for example, six hours. Okay. The, for, for for these. So the simulation times are a little shorter, but that's also because the process is a little stochastic, and there is an increase in, in temperature as you apply the current to the to a real sample, which is not completely uh, covered for in our in our models. We have uh, estimated temperatures and assigned them in the model, while here we of course have in the experimental measurement actual real temperatures that are changing in real time. Okay, and there are last thing, I don't know if someone is, ah, sorry, there's someone is asking a question, Emmanuel. Um, I can, yeah, you can unmute now. Um, Emmanuel Martinez, you can ask. Yeah. Can you hear me? With, no. Yes, very loud and clear. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, could you please repeat the uh, characteristics of light beam that induce the oxygen, uh, oxygen migration? Uh, come again, why we use oxygen migration? Uh, what, what, what is the, the, the source of, of light, the, the, the wavelength and the characteristics? Yeah, but yeah. I think he's asking what are the characteristics no, of the light beam inducing oxygen migration? But light induced. Well, it's not oxygen migration, it's uh, excitation. But uh, what's the source is a mercury lamp. We use a 
filter to filter it to 550 nanometers. But did I understand your question correctly? Did you ask me about the source of light in the, in, for this? Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so it's a mercury lamp. We use it just uh, the part of our it's part of our optical setup, and we pass it through a filter and just illuminate. But uh, we did not perform spe spectra, uh, spectral analysis on the light or you know, go further. Okay, thank you. Problem. The reference here, of course, has much more detail on, on, on the spectral part of this discussion. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, one last question for anyone. Yeah, maybe I ask one, a very little one, because you did mention at the beginning, you have done, I think also the magneto-optic uh, experiments. So I was just wondering if, yeah, uh, what extra information? Uh, well, we essentially use them to confirm how good of a superconductor our films okay. are. So here you can see the, wait, let me. Here you can see a comparison between an optical image and a magneto-optical image. And you yeah. can see the dark parts are low magnetic field. The okay. green parts are high magnetic field, so we see complete expulsion of the magnetic field. Okay, the sorry. And we essentially uh, scan all our devices to see if all of them are good before we start using them. Okay, but I was wondering, you could also see the, well, the currents, right, in principle, flowing, but... <clears throat> well, you, there are setups which use MY to image, for example, vortices. Yeah, that's what, but then you have to do this differential. Yeah, yeah but that, that, yeah. that needs to be done in a different setup, yeah, yeah. I can do it here. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Very so, much for yeah. Uh, our next speaker is Enea Maori. Enea, if you can share your yeah. screen. Hi. Great. Thanks. I will start the timer because we. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. So, for. Uh, Thanks to the organizer, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And uh, I will tell you a bit about uh, holographic plasmas in the work I did under the supervision of uh, Professor Stoff in Utrecht. And uh, as many people in the audience today, I mean, sleep in uh, strange metals, that are these metals with some peculiar properties that cannot be described by the um, usual Fermi liquid theory, like the most famous of. Uh, which is this linear interior resistivity, and we are particularly interested in them because they represent, represent the normal phase of uh, high temperature superconductor. And um, in particular, some example of this strange metal are the cuprates, and we are interested in plasmas because these cuprates sometimes uh, they are just studied as a single layer, sometimes as a multi layer system, like in uh, with uh, experimental uh, cases. Uh, of um, uh, one year ago, where uh, they studied the charge dynamics of these layer systems. And what we observed are these linear excitation, which are the so-called acoustic plasma. And these excitation are a typical excitation of uh, a charge system with Coulomb interaction among the la different layers. So as theorists, we are interested in trying to modeling this uh, strongly interacting system. And especially in, um, in the experiment, uh, we can uh, measure the lifetime of this excitation. So we want to see if we can build a model where we can reproduce this uh, kind of results. And one of the tools that is used to study strongly interacting systems is the so-called holographic duality. As the name suggests, duality is just a correspondence between two theory. One is our strongly interacting theory that we want to study. And the other one is a gravitational theory that lives in one higher dimension. And I won't go too much into details into, uh, into this, but I just want you to think about it as a tool that we can use to compute response function of the strongly interacting system. Because by being strongly interacting, we can't just use perturbation theory, but thanks to this duality, we can use perturbation theory in this higher dimensional gravitational theory to extract the response function of the system to small perturbations. 
there is a sort of dictionary to translate between the two. So for example, we can introduce uh, a Maxwell field and a gravitational theory to reproduce uh, a finite density in our strong interacting system. And if we want to introduce a finite temperature, we can just put a black hole in our gravitational theory. And this is the real power of uh, holography is that uh, it allows you to compute the response function at uh, a generic non-zero temperature and non-zero density. The problem though is that uh, with uh, any general gravitational theory that you put into this duality, the response function you get at low energy will look something like this. Here we are looking at the density response of the system, which is small perturbation. And what you see here is just a hydrodynamic sound one. And this is the typical response of a neutral system, one where there are no interaction, Coulomb interactions among the charged particles. But uh, we have seen that uh, it is important if you want to describe this layer system to introduce a Coulomb interaction so to study a charged material, not a neutral one. So we wanted to find a way to introduce this effect of Coulomb interaction in holographic models. And uh, by looking at, uh, by taking inspiration from field theory, where this Coulomb interaction can be taken into account uh, via this uh, random phase approximation, but it's basically just bubble resolution where this kind of knot is uh, your density response without uh, uh, Coulomb interactions. And the Coulomb potential basically dress this density response and give you a final total density response of the system that takes this form. And we notice that uh, we can get this form of the response function in our holographic model by modifying our higher dimensional gravitational theory by adding a boundary term where we couple basically the, the current, the density that we can compute from this gravitational theory to a dynamical photon in the boundary. Where this uh, alpha square parameter is uh, basically the, your charge, your uh, electron charge. And by, by choosing a current, or density in this case, that is restricted to a 2D plane, you can basically rederive the uh, two dimensional Coulomb potential. And so we can recompute the density response function that I've shown before with uh, this deformation. And what we find is indeed a plasmon mode with uh, the typical square root behavior that you would expect. Uh, in a two-dimensional layer, because in this case we are studying a two-dimensional layer with a three-dimensional Coulomb interaction. And now that we know how we can describe this uh, Coulomb interaction, then we can start playing around and try to see if we can build the toy model of uh, the is a strongly interacting layer system. And what uh, the way we do it is uh, we take um, a 2D layer that is described by this gravitational theory, that means that it has strong in-plane interaction, but uh, these interactions are short range. And so the only thing that couples this otherwise independent layer is this uh, Coulomb interaction that we add as a boundary deformation. And by doing a similar procedure as before, we can just derive an effective Coulomb potential that uh, takes this form. But here you have two momenta. You have uh, L that is the uh, space between the layers. And there is an in-plane momentum that is uh, this K and this out-of-plane momentum that is uh, this piece of the out-of-plane momentum basically is going to modify the response. And as long as uh, uh, the density fluctuations of these layers are not in phase, so this uh, uh, PL is different than zero or a multiple of two pi, then the response you get is indeed something that if you look at very low energy is linear in uh, uh, momentum. And this is the so-called acoustic plasmon that was observed experimentally. Now this does not come as a surprise 
So I want to emphasize here that uh, if you have a, a system, even described by simple hydrodynamics with a sound mode, and you have uh, a form of effective potential like the one shown before, then you're going to get an acoustic plasma. But what holography gives you that uh, more than hydrodynamics is um, the lifetime of this excitation, because the lifetime of excitation depends on the strong, the strong interaction that are described by this gravitational theory. So by finding a way of describing with uh, acoustic mode uh, with uh, holographic theory, we hope that we can finally find a connection between this holographic theory and the experiment so that we can actually test uh, if our uh, gravitational theory can reproduce some results or use the experiment as a guidance to understand what gravitational theory we could use to properly describe these uh, systems. And since this is not that straightforward, we were also thinking about uh, maybe a quantity that we can compute, like a simple quantity that we can compute that uh, would already tell us something about um, the validity of our theory. And since we have this way of describing Coulomb interaction, we thought that uh, we can uh, try to describe a simple system made of just two independent layers with strong interaction, again, coupled only by the Coulomb interaction among them, and study what is called the Coulomb drug. The Coulomb drug is just the effect that you get when you uh, let a current flow through one of the layer, but you leave the other layer unsourced. And due to this drug mediated by Coulomb, the Coulomb interaction, you generate uh, a voltage in the unsourced layer. And by measuring the voltage, you can uh, find the, uh, the resistance. So how do you relate these to the model of, uh, to the holographic model of a layer? A way is by repeating the same procedure we did before. So describing this system and coupling it, we can find an effective uh, uh, Coulomb potential between the two layers that takes this rather complicated form. But uh, uh, with the one you notice that these chi1 and chi2 are just the response function of a neutral system without Coulomb interaction. So this is indeed can be computed from this gravitational theory. And now, once we have this potential, we could compute the, uh, the resistivity by simply solving this integral. And with this, we can first of all compare like the temperature dependent, for example, and see how it differs from Fermi liquid. And also by studying this temperature dependence and resistivity in general, uh, we can uh, try to understand if it does match with something that can be measured or uh, if we have to change our gravitational theory because the resistivity is mostly determined by the pole structure of, uh, of this uh, uh, double layer response, of this response of a, a two layer system. And this is given mostly by three contribution. One that is given by the diffusive mode that is uh, always present in these uh, uh, density perturbations. The second one that is the linear one that you see here is indeed, uh, what I'm plotting here by the way is this, uh, uh, is uh, the integral over here. And uh, this uh, linear mode in the, is indeed the acoustic plasma, while the square root mode that you see here is uh, the optical plasma, the one uh, from a single layer. That uh, they, co they correspond at the in phase fluctuations and out of phase fluctuations of the double layer system. And uh, as you can see in the picture on the right, where I take a slice at a fixed value of momentum, then you have uh, the contribution of the diffusive mode at uh, small energy than the sound and, uh, and the square root mode. And in this range of temperature, the sound mode is the one that dominates. 
So by simply studying how this uh, resistivity depends on temperature, you can already get some information about uh, the kind of excitation in the system. And so we can numerically compute this integral and uh, then we basically hope indeed that these results can guide us towards finding uh, uh, the right gravitational theory to describe uh, this, uh, this kind of strange method. And um, so basically to sum up, we just uh, saw the importance of uh, adding uh, Coulomb interactions in uh, the description of strongly interacting systems. And since uh, holography is one of the main tools we can use to describe such systems at non-zero temperature and non-zero chemical potential, it is essential if we want to uh, describe a realistic uh, system to introduce this, uh, uh, this chrome interaction in, uh, in holography. And we hope indeed that uh, this will bring us a bit closer to a realistic model, a realistic theoretical model of the strongly interacting strange methods. And this is all I wanted to say. And uh, I thank you all for listening. And if you have any question, obviously, I would be glad to answer. Thanks, Enya. Very interesting talk. I have to say, I didn't know that you need a black hole to represent temperature. So. <laughs> Yes, yeah, and uh, that is uh, this extra dimension basically parameterize the energy scale. So, like in the interior of the space time, you are describing the low energy behavior of uh, your dual strongly interacting system. And so, if you think about it, if you put a black hole, you're basically putting a cutoff in the low energy part of your theory. So, it, Let's say it does make a sense that if you, put, if you put a black hole, you represent some scale, some uh, infrared scale of your theory. I guess it would depend. I mean, if you want to represent, I mean, just curiosity, represent different temperatures, then how? You change you the that? radius of the black hole. The radius, okay, okay. So that's right, yeah, interesting. Um, I don't know if uh, there are any questions from the audience first. Um, I was wondering just to see if I understood correctly this uh, well kind of experiment that you do when you apply current in one layer mm -hmm. um, and then measure the voltage in the other one. With that one, you would be able to determine how strong the coupling is between the layers, or what kind of again information do you get from that? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, let's say that uh, the resistivity. So what you can measure by doing this experiment depends indeed by uh, these, these chi one are the response function of this uh, strongly interacting system. So the resistivity itself depends on the structures of uh, this uh, strongly interacting system. And uh, this is indeed basically the, the integrand and the lifetime of these excitations are, are described with uh, I mean, depends on the kind of interaction you have in the system. So our goal is to use holography to do properly describes the strong interaction in these strange methods. And since the strong interaction on the one that determines the lifetime of this excitation, and this in, in the end is what determines the resistivity, we want to check that by measuring the resistivity, you can kind of match what we expect from uh, from our model. I see. Uh, it reminds me because when when I started my PhD, we were doing these experiments in high TC superconductors where you actually work with called the gyro uh, transformers. So you apply current on one on the top and measure the voltage basically on the bottom of the well. There there were single crystals, so you have many many layers. But if uh, yeah, if one would be able to reduce uh, dimensions and get to the limit, I mean, your theoretical limit is very extreme, right? So you have only one single layer, uh, but yeah. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, I didn't understand exactly. Your yeah, no, that there are, yeah, from the old time, there are experiments done on transport measurements on high DC mm -hmm. superconductors where you apply current on the top uh, of the uh, single crystal, let's say. Uh, so the mm -hmm. current flows inhomogeneously, uh, and then you measure voltage on the other side. So you apply current basically on, on one part of the material and then measure a non local, so, so say, non local voltage. So I was thinking it's a similar configuration as the one you showed with applying current in one single layer. Yes, yes, I think so. Although I have to admit that uh, I'm not too familiar with experimental setup, but uh, yes, I do think that it is similar to what you're describing. Right. Um, I don't see any question. Last chance for everyone. Uh, just a curiosity, with, with this kind of holographic techniques, uh, is it possible also to describe uh, uh, non-equilibrium phenomena uh, and some dynamics of the system? Um, I mean, you, can describe, you can describe um, a linear response with uh, this kind of uh, holographic theory. So everything other than that, no, it becomes a bit too complicated. I don't know if someone has done anything more, but in general, you stop at linear response. Okay, M many thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you can stop sharing, in the end. thanks. We we try uh, since we this is the end of the first part of the session on uh, superconductivity we thought maybe it's a good moment to try to get a picture of uh, participants so if you are don't mind <laughs> to open your cameras and we take a snapshot of everyone at least we have a record I mean, some souvenirs from uh, this morning and wait a second, don't be shy. Yeah, okay, so smile. Claudia, you have your camera off. <laughs> I would take another one. So I'll be okay. Yeah. Okay, All right. so. Great. Uh, uh, yeah, Marina is here. Ah, sorry, I, I, yeah, I forgot. That's what you were saying. Marina is still at okay. Yes, yeah, so we didn't finish the session. Sorry, Marina. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> I will forget you. <laughs> so if you can share your screen, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, can you see it well? Yeah, if you go into the um, this presentation, oh, please, because we have this here. Um, okay. Great, thanks, go ahead. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. I'm going to present my work on the optimization of lamp element superconducting resonators for quantum computing with molecular spin qubits. Well, the field of quantum computing uh, has been interested in the scientific area uh, since many years ago. Uh, it consists on the processing of basic units of information called qubits. Those qubits consist on a physical system with at least two energy levels with some quantum coherence in order to do some operations with them. The usage of a spin degree of freedom uh, as a quantum bit presents a lot of um, interesting properties for quantum computation, such as long coherence times, tunability, reproducibility, and scalability. But we need a platform where we can interact quantum mechanically with those qubits. So for that, we proposed a hybrid quantum system in which we have photons trapped in a superconducting cavity, and those photons are going to interact with those uh, magnetic 
systems are secured. There are several types of cavities uh, to use for this purpose. Um, for that, we propose to use superconducting lamp element resonators as a cavity. Uh, the superconducting materials permit us to have low losses so that long photon lifetimes in the cavity and lamp element resonators, which consist a lamp inductor and capacitance coupled to a transmission line, permit us to vary the design and geometry in order to have couplings with different physical systems. This technology permits us to read out the state of the qubit uh, if we have enough coupling between the electronic photons in the cavity and the spin qubits. This coupling is given by the coupling rate, G, and it has to be higher than the decoherence rate of the photons in the cavity and the decoherence rate of the spin qubit. Uh, this permits also to coherent control and to make a qubit entanglements. Uh, as we are going to work with magnetic molecules, the coupling between the magnetic molecules and the photons in the cavity are going to be mediated by the magnetic field generated in the resonant cavity, as we can see in this formula. So our work consists on the development and properly design of this type of resonator in order to, in order to achieve long photon lifetimes and also a strong coupling with the magnetic molecules as a qubit. Uh, so these lamp element resonators are characterized by its resonant frequency, which depend on the lamp inductance and capacitance, also by the energy losses in the resonators, which can be through the material itself, which is accounted in the internal quality factor and which depend on the superconducting material that we are going to use, and also on some external parameters such as the magnetic field or, or temperature. Also, the energy can be lost uh, by the coupling with the transmission line, which is accounted in the coupling quality factor. Another really important parameter of the design of these resonators is their impedance, and it must be tuned um, in order to achieve a strong coupling with different physical systems. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry, because I minimized. Uh, well, uh, we characterize those type of resonator measuring the transmission coefficient through the transmission line. As we can see here, we get a deep minimum at the resonant frequency, which is a Lorentzian-like shape peak, which is characterized by the quality factor and the resonant frequency of the resonator. Deep minimum means that at the resonant condition, all the power is absorbed in the resonator. And as these lamp element resonators are lamp elements, uh, they have the advantage that all the current is going to be uniformly distributed through the inductor. This current is depending on the resonant frequency and the impedance of the resonators. So taking all these parameters into account, we are going to, decide to design our hybrid system in order to achieve magnetic couplings with the magnetic molecules. First of all, we choose the resonant frequency of our resonators, depending on the transition frequency of the spin system. These uh, lamp element resonators present the advantage that uh, they are multiplexable, so we can couple many resonators to the same transmission line, changing the resonant frequency of each one, so that we can couple different tra spin transitions in the same chip. For example, here we change the resonant frequency of each pixel, changing the length of the capacitance. When we have the resonant frequency fixed, we have to optimize the magnetic field generated by the inductor in the resonator. And for that, we change the impedance of the resonator, changing the inductance geometry. This is also important depending on the 
type of physical system that we want to couple. For example, if we want to couple a spin ensemble, we have to take into account uh, that we have to maximize the magnetic mode volume as the coupling rate between the photons in the cavity and the magnetic molecules depend on the overlap between the magnetic mode uh, in our cavity and the, magnet and the volume of our magnetic sample. Whereas if we, for example, want to couple with smaller samples with few spin, or if we want to achieve the single spin coupling limit, uh, we have to decrease this magnetic volume. So for that, we concentrate all the magnetic volume in a thin inductor coupled to a big interdigital capacitor, achieving smaller inductance, that with higher inductors. Uh, continue with this uh, purpose, we shrink the inductor wire in order to concentrate the magnetic field near the surface at this point, so that we can achieve a higher single spin couplings, uh, couple a single spin in the point with higher magnetic fields near the surface. But this type of design had the disadvantage that this big interdigital capacitor is going to introduce some parasitic inductance, so that this is going to limit the minimum impedance that we can achieve. So for that, we propose to use this type of resonators, which consist on a parallel plate capacitor instead of the interdigital one. Uh, so this permits us to reduce the impedance of our capacitors below one ohms. But this type of design has the problem that the insulating layer, uh, which is in the capacitor, is going to minimize the internal quality factor of the resonator because it introduces uh, some noise. So taking all, all these parameters into account, we design and fabricate this type of chips. Here, for example, we can see one chip in which we, in which we have 12 different lamp element resonators coupled to one transmission line, changing its characteristic resonant frequency. Then we measure our, our device in this setup at low temperature. So with the transition temperature of our niobium film, we can see that we have high quality niobium films. Also, we can confirm our simulation by the concordance between the measurement and the simulations. If we do an appropriate fitting to each resonant peak, uh, we can resolve our resonant frequency and quality factor, and so that the photon decay rate in the cavity and the photon lifetime. As we can see here, we achieve a high quality factor resonators with long photon lifetimes. Uh, with just one frequency sweep over all the chip, we can resolve all the pictures, all the pixels, where each minimum in the transmission signal is related with each pixel. Here we can see the internal quality factor and the coupling quality factor. The homogeneity and the high values of the internal quality factor represent that we have a high quality niobium films. Also, we can show how we can tune the coupling quality factors in this case, in this case, changing the distance between the transmission line and each pixel, and also the type of coupling between the pixel and the transmission line, as we can see here. When we have the bare resonator characterized, we try to couple some magnetic uh, spin ensemble to one of the pixel. Here, for example, we try to couple a free radical called BPPH with one half spin. This represents the energy level diagram of our magnetic molecule. And we can see how changing the external magnetic field, we can change the energy levels of the molecules because of the Thiemann effect. 
So if we measure now the transmission through all the chip um, applying external magnetic fields, we can see that when we have the photons in the cavity out of resonance with the magnetic molecules energy level, uh, we can resolve just one transmission peak. But at a certain magnetic external field in which we have the energy level of our molecule uh, coupled in resonance with the energy level of the photons, we can resolve two peaks which are related with the two new energy levels of the hybrid systems, system. Uh, and the coupling between the photons in the cavity and the magnetic molecule is given by the distance in frequency between those two new energy levels. As we can see here, we achieve uh, some coupling between the magnetic molecules and the photons in the cavity, which in this case is higher than the photon decay rate and the decay rate of the magnetic molecule. So this means that we can achieve a strong coupling between both systems. So uh, to sum up, I can show how uh, we can fabricate high quality factor lamp element resonators made of, of niobium and how we can uh, couple magnetic molecules to this chip. Now we work on the optimization of new type of uh, resonators in order to couple different magnetic systems, such as bigger magnetic molecules with more number of spins or uh, small nano droplets of free radicals molecules. Also, we are going to try to couple with quantum dots. Then we need to characterize our system at lower temperatures and also to optimize the superconducting material and oxidize in order to increase the internal quality factor of our resonators. Thank you very much. And that's all. Thanks, Marina. Very nice talk. Um, so we have a question in the chat, Seiko. I uh, will open your mic so you can start. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. First of all, I, I actually was quite, quite glad to hear from Marina here that somebody is using scattering parameters, right? Uh, which is more engineer, uh, let's say, jargon than, than uh, uh, physicist. But my question would be, so you only, you only, I saw on your slide deck that you only showed S21, but did you actually check the rest of the scattering parameters? And also how do they, so is, do you have like, uh, did you test if the S21 is directly translating into the transfer function of the system or is there some deviation from there? Sorry, because, um, one moment, because I can't hear you really well and I'm trying to, to, okay. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Okay, so, so my question was, besides this S21 scattering parameter that you showed, did you try to estimate the remaining uh, three uh, scattering matrices? The reflections from S11, S22, and also is S12 equivalent to S21, or there, are there any differences? Uh, well, we just measure uh, S21 scattering parameter uh, because we need some amplification to have enough uh, response. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so we need to add a low noise uh, amplificator that I have here um, between the UNA and our sample. Ah, okay, I see. And also, for example, uh, did you check at which point your S21 parameter uh, crosses uh, minus 3 dB point? Uh, yes. What, what's, yes. The, what's the value of that frequency usually? Uh, well, we optimize uh, the the um, S21 response, uh, choosing the choosing properly the quality factor. Yes. Uh, so that uh, we can achieve the minus three dBm. Yes, but, uh, but which frequency? At which sorry? At which frequency did you see minus three dBm? Uh, well, at the resonance frequency, right? Uh. 
I mean, it doesn't yeah, it does, doesn't necessarily need to correspond because that's just the place where your power drops by one half. Uh, uh, yes, but we optimize that or we get that uh, when we have a critical coupling so that we have an internal quality factor which uh, is the same with the, um, as the coupling quality factor. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else question? Maybe I'll ask a small one. Uh, so you show these results, they're done on, on yeah, niobium, right? So the question is, uh, why did you choose niobium or how do you think, I mean, is it to, to optimize the coupling or, yeah? yeah? Well, we choose niobium because of its transition temperature and also because of its uh, critical magnetic field. Uh, because as I said, we need to apply uh, some magnetic fields to the fin to tune the, um, the energy levels of the magnetic molecules. And now we also try to, well, we are going to start to use a, a titanium and niobium nitride uh, which has a higher uh, transition temperature. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think we are on time for the next one then. Thanks, Marina. Again. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, we have one more question. I don't know, I can read in the ah. chat. Ah, yes, I go again. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, can you open? Yes. Can you open your mic? Yes. I'll, I'll just yeah. have a short question uh, for Marina. Did you test the linearity of your non-linearity in your system? How much uh, does it contribute? Usually, usually, I mean, if you design your system as such to be as linear as possible, there will be at least some non-linearities hidden in the noise. So let's say I could rephrase my question. Did you test? Uh, did you check uh, the the noise spec uh, no, noise specs just to see? How much do they, let's say, how much do they relate to the useful signal? Uh, well, yes, uh, we are working now on the op optimization of this noise, uh, but now uh, the thing that we optimize is the input power that we apply to the Uven A to do our measurements. Uh, so the, the power that we use to measure our device is the one that uh, introduce uh, less noise in our system and also the better uh, internal quality factor of our device. Okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, if you can, you can also write her privately if you still have questions uh, in the chat. Uh, and so we can move on to the next uh, part of the session. So I uh, let uh, Janit continue now. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. So, hello. Thank you, Mariela. Can you maybe stop sharing the screen? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. So uh, now we move to the next subsession about uh, metal insulator transitions. And uh, our first speaker is an invited speaker from AWTH Aachen in Germany. So Matthias Wutig, are you there, Matthias? Matthias? You should, you should switch on the microphone. Where is he? Okay. Now there I got the license to talk. Very good. So you can share your Thanks. screen. Thanks. Perfect. I can do that. So I will warn you when there are five minutes left. Huh? Yes, so but I still need to get the net to get become the co-host. I'm not the co-host yet. So somebody has to define me as a co-host. Yes, just one second.
Dann. Noch. Okay, perfekt. We are all set. Very good. Very good. Okay. You can see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be part of this um, exciting session. And the title of my presentation is Designing Metal Insider Transitions in Heavy Check Organites. Now, me, I might be pondering what do these heavy check organites have to do with functional quantum materials? And why does designing an MIT is linked to emergent uh, transport phenomena? Therefore, uh, basically, the first thing I'm trying to accomplish is to demonstrate to you that heavy check organites are functional quantum materials. This is claim number one, which I intend to prove in a little while. And claim number two is, since they are functional quantum materials, they show exciting emergent transport properties. So these are the two claims I'm trying to um, validate today. And um, I will focus for at least um, 10 minutes or a bit more on the aspect of uh, functional quantum materials and how this is related with heavy check organites. So claim number one is heavy check organites are fun uh, functional quantum materials. And you can look at uh, the different uh, possible applications which to really demonstrate that um, heavy check organites are functional materials. I have not proven the word quantum materials yet, but they're functional materials as you can see from the application potential, this uh, ranges from thermoelectrics such as PVTE, SNTE, tux or bismuth telluride to topological insulators like sp 2 t 3 or tin telluride or bismuth selenide to superconductors such as AG, SN, SE2 or to phase change materials like germanium telluride or GE2, sp 2 t 5 So with this broad application potential, it gets pretty clear that these heavy check organites are functional materials. And functional materials are pretty interesting for a number of different applications. This one here is one from Asia. You might like to drink a hot cup of tea after the sessions today. And here you see a version where the cup stirs itself since the hot tea is creating energy. There's waste heat and the waste heat is then utilized, transformed into electric energy. Um, via the thermoelectric effect um, and that uh, enables you to stir this uh, cup of tea. Now this uh, concept uh, behind thermoelectricity is, uh, is pretty, pretty simple. In principle you only have to um, advance the figure of merit ZT which depends upon the Zeebeck coefficient, the thermal and the electrical connectivity. Um, and um, this is demonstrated here that this is how this uh, figure of merit looks like. The best possible thermoelectric materials here now have ZT factors of the order of two, and you would definitely like to raise ZT up to values around four. Uh, but even with a value of ZT of the order of two, you already can do pretty cool things since uh, the um, thermoelectric effect does not uh, depend upon any moving parts. So it's highly reliable, as you can see from this picture here of the uh, spaceship uh, Voyager which is the first man-made object that has uh, left our solar system about 10 years ago and still every two years sends a little report back to Earth on, on the weather in, uh, in outer space. So clearly you can do interesting things with these uh, functional materials uh, of these heavy check organites. There is another interesting application that we have been working on for the last uh, more than 15 years and this is phase change materials which are utilized uh, for data storage. Here you have check organites which you raise above the melting temperature and then you rapidly quench them down, quenching rates of the order of 10 to nine Kelvin per second. And then you stabilize this liquid like amorphous state. And interestingly, in these materials, the amorphous state is fundamentally different from the crystalline state in terms of optical and electrical properties. You can use this for optical and electronic data storage for novel photonic devices and another thing. And uh, right now, such a memory is on the market developed by Micron and Intel. And um, this is actually the first fundamental new memory that has been uh, developed in the last uh, three decades. And uh, this is filling a very interesting niche between uh, the, um, the hard disk drive and the, the much faster DRAM. And for this storage class memory, there are two important challenges. One is how to increase the speed of this device 
And the second one is how to reduce the power consumption of these devices. And this um, raises a question how we can design better materials for these different applications. Now, if you think about this challenge of designing materials or designing actually even quantum materials, as I want to demonstrate in a short while, we all know and, and we strongly believe that there's a close link between the atomic arrangement and the physical properties. We can determine the atomic arrangement with great precision. We can determine properties, as we have seen in the last talk very beautifully, with remarkable precision. So this is very well established. But usually we want to modify design or tailor properties. That means we have to modify atomic arrangements, which we can do if we understand the link between chemical bonding and atomic arrangement. The difficulty is that we really struggle to characterize or to quantify chemical bonding in solids in significant detail, which means that there's a wonderful road from chemical bonding to physical properties is not very often traveled. Yeah. And we have to wonder if there's something that we can improve. And indeed, recently we have suggested a novel kind of, of, of map uh, that characterizes bonding in solids uh, together with uh, Jean-Yves Fratty. And this uh, depends upon two crucial quantities. So first of all, we define a quantum atom. You know, this basically means we look at atoms in a solid and we define a basin surrounding the atom based upon an evaluation of the charge density. So an atom with a larger charge density will automatically have a larger basin. So this is uh, concept number one. And then we look at the charge transfer between adjacent basins. And this is this electron transfer shown here. Yeah, so this, uh, this is one important quantity. The second quantity is this is now a pair density. We look at the probability of one electron being in one basin and a second electron being the second basin. So this is evidence for electron pair formation. Remember Gilbert Lewis and this little bond that you draw in the chemical classes for identifying a chemical bond. So, but now to make it simpler for a physicist, maybe more confusing for the chemist, we decided to plot not the number of electron pairs, but twice this number, which is the number of electrons shared between adjacent atoms. And this gives this kind of map here. Now I'm trying to convince you that this is uh, one of the nicest view graphs I've pre created in, in my scientific career. Now you might be pondering how I can be so emotional about a figure such as this, which clearly is uh, depressingly gray, huh? and also a little bit disorganized. Yeah, so it looks like a, pretty much a random distribution of, of points in this map. But I would like to emphasize the solution comes from the Schrodinger equation. Yeah, this is really quantum mechanics. It includes a pair density. So there are electron correlations involved, which are real true bonds. And the points of this map are stable. If you know another code, there are two codes available right now to make these calculations. The points that you would get for gallium nitride or PBS do not move. Yeah? So you can remember and, and, and learn about these uh, positions of these points on the map. And now we can work on the color and we can order the map a bit more if we ponder about the fact that here is the sodium chloride and this here is, is uh, magnesium oxide. And there's clearly more charge trends for magnesium oxide than in sodium chloride. But this is clear, a chemist would remember that sodium chloride has an oxidation state of one, magnesium oxide has an oxidation state of two. So we now we divide by this formal oxidation state and then our map looks like this. So now there is a very clear transition from ionic materials like sodium chloride and um, elemental diamond, which is in the other area here. Still it is, um, bit gray the map and now we can start to use material properties to identify different bonding mechanisms. And I think everybody in this audience would agree that it's silver and, and, and sodium here that these are metallic compounds based upon their conductivity and their mechanical properties. So I can say look these are the metallic compounds. We can also make a statement about the van der Waals bonding that we have in argon and, and, and solid helium. So these are van der Waals bonded systems. Um, then we can also look at um, ionic and covalent compounds and there's graphite as a resonantly bonded material. And um, now we basically have, have a map uh, which nicely separates metallic, ionic and covalent bonding. 
This is clearly appealing. Interestingly, there's a class of materials. So all of the checkoganites I mentioned before, PBTE, PBS, SNTE, GET and SP2, T3 are up here. All of them are neither characterized as being covalent, as being ionic or being metallic. So there is clearly evidence you know, that uh, we have not only now a map that separates different bonding mechanisms, but it also implies there could be another bonding mechanism, and this is this green area here. So scientifically, this seems to be a good map. The only true provocation of this map comes uh, from this green color um, in, in this area here. And so this is a provocation that, that this map provides that we are arguing that there is this region here, which is neither ionic nor covalent nor metallic. So this is the statement that we really have to defend to ensure that this map has predictive power. So we have three key arguments why indeed um, there is the right to give this region a distinct color. And this first of all are properties. We're looking at different um, identifiers of chemical bonding based upon properties. And I think everybody agrees that a material with a very high conductivity is a metallic material. While um, if you have materials with very low conductivity, this very likely is an ionic material. And the current materials are somewhere in between. We can also use the effective coordination number, the optical identity constant, the bone effective charge, and the mode specific Grün Eisen parameter as in total five different fingerprints for material properties. And then you realize that these metavalent materials have a distinct set of properties. Importantly, their properties are not a linear combination of any other uh, property fingerprints that we have. You can see this, for example, from this uh, mode specific Grünersen parameter. That's a measure of the anemonicity. This is high in these materials, but it's low in both covalent and metallic systems. So the properties are telling us these materials are unique. The region the map tells us these materials are unique and they have unique bonding mechanisms. We can do something else. We had um, um, an interesting experiment uh, performed um, on two different modifications of a phase change material. This is a compound of selenium, tellurium, and germanium in the amorphous state and the crystalline state. We make a very sharp tip of this material and put this into an atom probe where we now dislodge atoms upon the application of a short laser pulse. And typically for the amorphous material, for a successful pulse, we typically only create one fragment. During the same experiment for this crystalline state here, typically we dislodge several fragments. So the bond breaking differs. And now we can compare this in this view graph here, and you can see that all of these materials in the green region show this untypical bond breaking where we have a high number of multiple events, why this is not the case for metallic or covalent systems. So another reason why this seems to be a unique bond. And finally, we have been uh, traveling the border here from metavalent to covalent behavior, and there always are discontinuous property changes. So this is a very well-defined border between green and red. So this is convincing us that scientifically, this is a good map with predictive power. And I hope that by now I've convinced you that um, these are interesting functional materials. And as a material scientist, you know, you could uh, explore the potential of this map to design new materials. As a physicist, I'm a little bit concerned that the physicists among you are not yet fully convinced. And since you're not convinced that bonds are useful, you're convinced that bands are useful. And so we have to make the, the step from bonds to bands. And finally, the chemist might be wondering, hey, what is the nature of, of the metabolic bond? Yeah, and all together with this um, open question marks that we had in here, I have not yet fully convinced you, I'm afraid, that heavy chacoanites are functional quantum materials. Yeah, quantum materials, I have to stress this word. So I'm getting back to this uh, quantum material aspect. But before, just uh, for the material physicist, I invite you to, to look at this, um, this animation here. Um, so this is a 3D map that you can click on and you see the different properties and how they change uh, with these different uh, bonding maps. 
This gives you a 3D animation of the relationship between chemical bonding um, and properties. You can use this as a material scientist to design properties and, and look for chemical bonding space, uh, how to locate uh, these materials. But now let's try to really pinpoint the quantum nature of this special bond. So what is striking from the point of view of, of the chemist is the fact that all of these materials in this green region here, they have something in common uh, in their atomic arrangement. They are all octahedral-like. So they have, on average, six nearest neighbors, sometimes with some distortions, but this is what they all have in common. And now we can look uh, what uh, will this lead to in, regarding the band structure. And everybody in this audience uh, can easily draw a band structure for a typical metal. You know, this is a typical band structure for a metal on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have the band structure for quinine material where there's a well-defined band gap. And now the question would be, hey, what is the band structure of a metavalent material? And so let's talk about these materials from the point of view of physics. And what we encounter here is a situation where we have metallic band, but this is half filled. Since as we'll show you in a second, typically we have a situation where we form sigma bonds of p electrons and there's just one p electron, but not two, to create a band. And this is a half filled band. And interestingly, these half filled bands are often unstable. There's either charge transfer, as described by electron transfer, our x axis of the map, or there are distortions as described by this concept of atron sharing. That's why we call these materials incipient metals. They're close to living their dream of being a metal, but they're not quite metals. I can also now draw this uh, from the perspective um, of, of a chemist. You know, we now make a sigma bond of this uh, p orbitals. Uh, these uh, p orbitals here are half filled. You know, so there in total is one atron between these two atoms. And this should give rise to metallic band. But then we have this band gap opening either via charge transfer, ET, or electron sharing, this pulse distortion, ES, that opens a small gap. So we have a small gap. So what's the nature of the new bond? We all know that in covalent and ionic compounds, there is localization of electrons either between the atoms, that's covalency, or at the ion cores, that's ionicity or there is delocalization as in metals. This green region is the competition zone. Yeah? We have a competition between delocalization and localization. And this proves that we have functional quantum materials you know, defined by this competition between delocalization and localization. And the nice thing is we can play with this competition. We can either favor localization, yeah, either go in going into this ionic direction, you are going here, or we can favor localization going here. We can also have a stress delocalization just going down. So this implies this all should have consequences for the charge transport. So if this map has any predictive power, it should be telling us by moving in certain directions in this map, we should see significant difference differences in charge transport, and we expect to see emergent transport phenomena. So this is now part number two. I am hope I'm doing okay with time. So we expect that metavalently bonded materials, you know, this is the name that we give to this uh, green region, should show emergent transport phenomena. And there's a first evidence for this. If we only look at the charge transport in these materials, this is the variation of the connectivity now for a broad range of different check organisms. And here as a reference, we have the typical connectivity at room temperature. These are all data for room temperature of a good metal, teak, silver, or copper. This is the connectivity of a good metal. Then you know there's this famous rule from Moy where there is a change in the temperature coefficient of resistivity at this magic value here, which is given here as this dashed blue line. And our typical heavy check organites are pretty close to this limit you know, of systems turning into bad metals. And so they're almost bad metals. You know, so clearly there seems to be a link between their bonding and their charge transport. But maybe this is not yet particularly well, 
exciting from a fundamental point of view. Maybe this is important from the material science point of view, but where's excitement on a more fundamental level? So I'm trying to demonstrate that it, there's indeed evidence for a very unconventional charge transport. And um, the story I would like to convey in the last uh, maybe five or seven minutes or so is that we can cross MRT, we produce a metal insulated transition, but without changing the charge carrier concentration. So we don't change the density of charge carriers, but we do something else instead. And this is um, pretty interesting since if you look back in the literature, we still have, I would like to say, an unsolved historic battle. And this is Mott versus Anderson. Yeah, so both have been trying to grasp what is the nature of a metal insulated transition that is not governed by a structural change, you know, where we go from a bent insulator to a bent metal. You know, so we know how to do that. But can we realize a purely electronically driven MRT? And Mott argued you can do this by a correlation phenomenon. Yeah, you reach a critical doping, for example, in phosphorus doped silicon, and your system will become metallic. Anderson had a very different view. He argued, hey, there should be a disorder-driven MIT. And for 50 years, there have been lots of arguments, pro and con, the nature of the MIT in phosphorus doped silicon, if this is governed by disorder or governed by correlations. And by now, almost giving up this kind of battle, people talk about the mott anderson transition in phosphorus doped silicon. So we can wonder, is there any chance to find something like an almost pure Anderson transition in an electronic system, given the fact that electrons always will kind of show some sense of correlation phenomena. So now we claim we can do this in um, this uh, chicoginate, this is tin antimony telluride, uh, SNSD2T4, also GST124 uh, and other uh, phase change materials show similar uh, properties. These materials, as you can see here, have a cubic atomic arrangement. It's octahedral, we have like a rock salt structure, and there's a large amount of stoichiometric vacancies. You can imagine tellurium has one sublattice, and tin and antimony are on the other sublattice. Yeah, so there's a large amount uh, of vacancies. There's one vacancy per four tellurium atoms. Um, and uh, these vacancies are stochastically distributed on this um, sublattice here, occupied by red, orange, um, and uh, white. So now we can take such a crystal in the form of thin film and heat this to different levels you know, of um, the random arrangement of vacancies. And with this, we have now a number of different observations. So once again, we take these films, we heat them to different mean temperatures, and therefore we tune the disorder. And then we measure the um, sheet resistance of these films. It's in principle the same film heated to higher and higher temperatures. So there's an irreversible ordering of the sample. And we start with um, a very insulating sample which is crystalline, and step by step, we make it more metallic. So we go from blue, insulating, high resistances, low temperature, to metallic, showing low resistances at high temperatures. Yeah, so, sorry, at, at low temperatures. No, so there's a clear transition from an insulating to a metallic um, state. Now, this is the blue and the red curve of these lines. Yeah, the first one. So clearly, what we observe, we observe a metal insulated transition. But there's a second message um, in these curves here. And this is the sign of, the, of the, this uh, direction of the triangle. So this here is the perpendicular magnetic resistance. And this here is the in-plane magnetic resistance. And we have two different um, signs. We have either a positive magnetic conductance. This is the blue color. Or we have a green color for a negative magnetic resistance. And you see that linked with this MIT, there's a transition from the blue to the green arrows, which is a transition from a positive to a neg negative magnetoconductance. Yeah? So we change the sign of the magnetoconductance at low temperatures and low fields. Yeah? So MIT and magnetoconductance sign change. 
And the third point is, as I will show you in a little while, that there's also a transition in the anisotropy yeah, of the magnetoconductance, as I will show you in a second. Five minutes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I'm moving quickly towards uh, the end. So now we can look, uh, first of all, at these uh, magnetic samples. And you can see here from this extrapolation of the conductance to very low temperatures, it's pretty obvious that indeed these are metallic samples. Now they have a non-vanishing conductivity in the limit of zero Kelvin. We can also look at the charge carrier concentration, which does not change significantly upon annealing to these uh, higher and higher temperatures. So this is the highest annealing state. We can look um, here at the um, magneto conductance, so in the magnetic field, and you see that uh, for the perpendicular direction, we have these sharp cuts. For the in-plane direction, this is how the curves look like. And if you compare the two, then we see that this here is a clear case, which is anisotropic, yeah? Anisotropic magnetoconductance. And this is the hallmark of weak anti-localization. We have fitted here the data, and you can see from these uh, dashed lines that this is a high quality fit. And uh, the important message is that uh, the inelastic dephasing field increases with increasing disorder and the MR anisotropy decreases. The N anisotropy gets weaker and weaker with increasing disorder. And this is a weak, um, weak um, anti-localization and it breaks down once we are moving too close to this uh, critical conductivity. On the inserting side, you know, there's a divergent resistance. You know, we can extract the localization at the hopping lengths. Um, and, and, the and the localization length is decreasing with increasing disorder. The hopping length is larger than the film thickness. So we have to describe this in the 2D limit. And we can also basically see um, how this depends upon temperature. Now, the important point is that now we have a positive magnetoconductance and this is symmetric. Yeah, this is not no longer anisotropic, it is isotropic. Yeah, so an isotropic positive magnetoconductance before in the metallic state, we had a negative magnetoconductance, which was anisotropic. And this is no longer the case here. So clearly this is here now isotropic behavior. This must be a very different mechanism. And it could be shown recently that this is a very special spin memory effect. We have hopping transport as in disordered systems. Yeah, this is typical variable range hopping. But now we also have to invoke the spin of the system. Yes, due to the disorder, there is some formation of spins. And now for a triplet speed, the triplet links a spin here, the probability from jumping from here to here is reduced compared with a singlet state. So there are spin correlations. And these spin correlations give rise to an isotropic magnetoconductance. And here you can see this. The dashed line here now are our simulations, and while the solid line is the experiment. Especially at low fields, this works uh, pretty well. So now let me, um, let me move on and uh, summarize what I've tried to, to show you here. I tried to um, convince you that heavy jacogonites are functional quantum materials. Uh, which um, provide an ideal playground to uh, study such emergent transport phenomena. These materials are technologically relevant in phase change materials and thermoelectrics in topological insulators. They provide a rich phase space, so you can do materials design. And there's an unconventional transport which um, you can utilize um, to unravel the nature um, of, of this, the MIT. And uh, we have um, linked this uh, with, uh, with a beautiful uh, picture that Salvador Dali has created. And this is the persistence of memory. And the effect we describe here is the persistence of spin memory. And um, we, we can do that in a sense, these materials have this uh, unconventional bonding mechanism of metavalent bonding. And this is all I wanted to show at this point in time. And, um, Thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, thank you, Matthias, for the presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK. So we actually already have a question here by Daniel Komsky. So let me yeah. activate your microphone. Yes. OK, I did. 
uh, uh, very nice uh, way to present the data. Well, we knew actually many of these things before, but it's very, uh, very nice way to uh, to, to make a system of this. But mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about uh, this relative importance of Anderson and uh, mm -hmm. correlation effect. You yourself mm -hmm. mentioned phosphorus dop silicon when there was this mm -hmm. battle. And uh, yes, then you uh, said that, okay, you want to find uh, the case when you have pure Anderson, no mm -hmm. correlation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, actually, in your own experiment, you have to deal with these spins, with spin correlations and yes. so on, spin memory. Yes. But uh, each time you have spins, effectively, it means that you have correlations. So in that sense, actually, in which sense uh, your example is really pure Anderson, or maybe it's also mixed. Uh, yes. uh, Anderson disorder induced effects and correlation effects. Yes. I suppose that actually they are always present both because yes. each time you have transition from itinerant to localized yes. or more localized yes. and uh, as soon as you have localized you are, have to deal with correlations anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Under, let me make a quick comment. I think you make a, you make a very good and a very strong point. Um, I think actually um, there, there are a number of arguments why why the pure separation of Mott and Anderson physics is, is pretty much impossible. So it's incredibly difficult. I agree. <laughs> that was exactly my point. Yes, but but there's but this this is I think shortly before lunch a little bit too pot, too pessimistic to kind of uh, enjoy lunch. So I think we we can say something a bit more. I think what is special about these systems here that in these systems we have very high levels of epsilon static. So the screening between different charges really is, is, is as good as can be. They're incredibly close to being metallic. And being very close to metallic and having very high levels of epsilon static, there is a strong level of screening. And that basically means, if you basically think about correlation effects, we can never make them disappear, but we can make them as small as possible. And making them as small as possible is a real option in these materials. So that's what they provide. They provide a kind of um, a promise that if you want to play with disorder and correlations in these systems, you have a limit where the correlations are very, very low. They're not, yeah. they're not disappearing. We can't do that, but we can make them weak. And here they are weak. Uh, I don't think that screening uh, matters a lot because uh, when we are speaking about correlations, we are dealing with something like Hubbard interaction, which is really on site. It doesn't care about screening. It's local interaction. And okay. just lo this local interaction gives rise to all your spins and spins uh, memory and so on. So without uh, this local Hubbard-like uh, correlations, uh, you would simply get it. Yeah, and That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. No, also, this is, is a valid point. But then, um, <laughs> then I have to, have, to get a, have to try differently to argue. If you think about these materials here and these, these uh, P electrons, we have relatively broad bands. And yeah. in, in the Hubbard physics, it's always this uh, U divided by W uh, argument. No? So what's the electron electron interaction divided by the, the width of, of, of your band? And these electrons here create relatively broad bands. So therefore, I would say that um, if you want to look for Hubbard physics, this is not the perfect place to look for Hubbard physics. Yeah, but once again, your uh, your own uh, example is counter argument. Phosphorus dop silicon. It's also p electron, and still we are speaking about correlation. Of course, it's not really d electrons, not transition metals, but phosphorus dop silicon is also not. So in that sense, I don't see big difference between phosphorus dop silicon and your material. Yeah. Okay. So this. So this. This third point. Um, I have to ponder about, about the potential difference. Um, I think one difference clearly comes from the fact that in phosphorus dropped silicon, we really have, um, we have a significant band gap with, with different states, uh, um, basically in the conduction and the valence band, while here, um, this is this, this um, special nature of this uh, metavalin bonding but I do need to ponder if this creates additional effects that I'm uh, overlooking right now. Yeah. Okay. okay. It becomes okay. already too specialized. Yeah. We have to mm -hmm. give a place yes. to uh, mm -hmm. 
Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Thank you. So if you want to Thank discuss you. discuss together afterward in a chat, mm -hmm. there is okay. no yeah. okay. no okay. problem. So are there maybe other questions? Uh, yes, I have a small one. Ah, there you are. Uh, very nice talk, Matthias. Thanks a lot. Very didactic. Um, just to see if I also understand it correctly, when you show this uh, table with all the, uh, it was only the, cal the calcogenized when the, with the resistivity, right? That you define the good or the conductivity, basically, good metal or not. So there is a series of materials that lie quite below, right? The limit. And I was wondering, is within the family of the decalcogenized, do you, is there any difference between them then that will make them yes. Uh, yes. far so away? From the, this is actually, this is in, 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 in two ways a very nice question. So one point is also here in this map, you see there are red triangles. Sorry, red, red diamonds. No, so you see these red diamonds. And these red diamonds are also chalcogonites. They are also octahedral, but they have a larger distortion and they have a much higher resistivity. So by, by crossing the border, for example, here from, from GETE to GESE, the resistance jumps once you cross the border by four or five orders of magnitude. So okay. you can have a chalcogonite that looks like GESE, you would think GSE is friends to GET, they should be similar, but they're not. Yeah, so there's a discontinuous transition. That, that's one direction. Yeah? So Chekhovanite doesn't automatically mean that you're in this metavalent regime with a special conductivity. Yeah, that's, that's one point. The, the second point is um, there also are other materials which are not Chekhovanites, which are also have a conductivity in the special region. But we do believe that at least some of them have similar bonding mechanisms. So one of the things we're working on right now, also together with Jean-Yves Frati, is proving that there are more materials that have GTE. I can forget about this talk. This is of no relevant for my work. But I do believe that there are more materials than the ones we're talking about today that have a similar bonding mechanism. Okay. So yeah, I was wondering, because you did mention this thing of, for instance, of the vacancies, and if that was maybe a difference that differentiates uh, the different uh, decalcogenites. Yeah, so clearly in this, in this second part of the talk uh, for, for this uh, MIT, the vacancies played a crucial role. Yeah. But we also have um, in this table, there are also quite a number of materials that do not have vacancies and also have a conductivity in a similar regime. Okay. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other, qu other question? So maybe I have a short one uh, while we are here. Uh, so you made, there are two parts in your talk, and here you have you have the map. Uh, I'm I'm well aware of that map, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, where are the the tin antimony telluride compounds that you show afterwards? Do you know? Or no, this is no this, yes. no, this, this is the can you guess? So, can you guess where they are? Yes, mm -hmm. I can guess. So let's 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 do this. Now, so one of these points here is sp two t three. Other point is gete, uh -huh. and we know that gst compounds are basically have properties which are intermittent between the two. Here is SNTE. This is SP2T3, so we can argue they are somewhere on this line here. But this is actually maybe a homework assignment for us to kind of make these calculations to also put GST onto this map, directly onto this map. Okay. Well, thank you. I see no more raised hand. So thank you again, Matthias. Thanks. So I think we can move to our